<clears throat> yep, there we are. Got it. And I'm realizing that I did that whole intro before actually pressing the go live button. So thank you to my wonderful <laughs> wife who pointed that out. So we're going to do that whole intro again. Welcome to Great Train Layouts Live. I'm your host, Nick Ozerak, and today we are building the Mylon branch of the Iowa Interstate Railroad, an HO scale shelf layout measuring about 16 feet to 19 feet. And we are giving it the train's pre-visualization treatment so that we could see what it looks like before our guest tonight built it because we have a special guest tonight in the form of the person who commissioned this build. So we're gonna be building it, we're gonna be getting his critique. So this could go really well, or it could be roasted for my skills. We'll find out which way that goes, <laughs> but uh, uh, we're gonna be uh, pre-visualizing the scenery and then we're gonna be play testing it. And I am pleased to be joined by Mr. Scott Thornton. Hi, Nick, how you doing? I'm doing good, and it's so great to have you for our first guest to Great Trade Layouts Live, let alone our first uh, commissioned uh, layout guest. So really glad that you could join us. This is going to be a cool experiment, and hope that you guys watching along enjoy this as well. If you have difficulty uh, hearing uh, either uh, me or Scott, just let me know, and I'll, I'll tweak the volume levels. So, Mylon Branch. Uh, what, where where should we get started with this, Scott? You want to start with the runaround uh, in the west or the uh, turnout runaround in the east? Yeah, we could start with the turnout uh, runaround on the on the east side. Or actually, the the branch runs north to south from Rock Island to the little village of. It's spelled Milan, but it's pronounced Milan. <clears throat> you know, the Americanization of all those Eastern names, I mean, European names. So, um, so it's uh, the Mylon branch of the Iowa interstate. And the Iowa interstate runs on former Rock Island trackage <clears throat> from Chicago to Council Bluffs, Iowa, and just across <clears throat> the Northern part of Illinois, excuse me a second. <clears throat> and then across Iowa. So, the brand the the railroad has set a couple different branch lines um the the mylon being one of the branches uh and rock island is one of the quad cities for anybody who might not know so um right next to the mississippi river on the illinois side and the branch runs north south and then it once it gets into, into mylon it, it it turns west but i liked I've always liked the Iowa interstate. I'm a native Iowan and um, I like the Rock Island and it was a good railroad to follow, um, a successful regional, if you will. And so when I got ready to build my, actually my very first layout <clears throat> after many years of false starts, um, I, I landed on this branch line of the Iowa interstate and it's uh it's a neat little branch line it has a, a huge variety of of industries and car types not not in terms of volume but just in diversity so that's what made it so appealing <clears throat> plus i'm a real fan of short wheelbase diesels and the year i'm modeling which is 2003 they ran a sw1200 number 250 which is a neat little switcher and then they also on occasion ran jeep tens so those two are probably my all-time favorite engines so that's kind of a short little synopsis of the branch line and if you want to see what this branch line looks like guys i encourage you there's two things number one i've put a link in the show notes to the track plan that scott's developed uh, the other thing, too, is if you just go to Google Maps and search Milan, Illinois, uh, you can find it pretty easily because you just you and I'm doing this right now as we speak, because as I'm doing this, I'm going to be referencing Scott's track plan. But because there's a lot of uh, Google Street View kind of thing around here, too, uh, I'm going to be using that as well to inform uh, some of the choices. Uh, so, for example, right now we're starting uh on the Rock Island side of things, and we're looking at uh, this. There's a 
uh, is a street going into what looks like a scrapyard. So is all this complex Dell's Metals? Yes, Dell's Metals is a large scrap dealer, and I believe they deal with several different types of scrap. It's it's quite a big yard. It's been there forever. Um, in 2003, the spur that led into the the yard was not there, but I'm modeling it anyway, taking artistic license. So that way I can uh, bring in, you know, beat up old gongs. And then um, really there's only three industries, Nick, that are, that are modeled on the line. Everything else is represented by staging. We have Dell's Metals, which is a scrap dealer. We have a bakery, Sarah Lee, and then we have an aggregate dealer called Consumers Aggregate. And um, so in terms of industries, there's not very many models. Which I think is fine to as a way of uh, being able to choose what are the priorities because anytime we're modeling, unless you're choosing a really small industrial park, being able to get everything just isn't practical. But if you're getting the, the flavor of the, the major industries in place, then uh, to have some of it represented by staging is a great way to, you're getting people into the world of it, but then you're able to include more switching opportunities. And as we see when we'll get to the play testing side, you've, you've designed, uh, well, some of these switch moves require specific orders of cars. Mm -hmm. and, and really, if I could say when I, you know, you had an article that ran in uh, several issues ago in Railroad Model Craftsman that, and this is really, it, this is what got me interested in doing something like this because I wanted to have, I was always curious about the, the virtual niche within model railroading. And um, so this was a perfect excuse to jump in there. But if my actual layout, which is under construction, was modeled virtually, then I could play around with um, setting up car movements and figuring out different operational schemes that I can apply to the layout, which I thought would be kind of kind of neat because for me, like so many of us, I spend time relaxing at the computer, so why not play with trains? Yeah, it's a great way to play test. Uh, a quick shout out to Blackbird Gaming. That is a very, uh, who says a Baba Booey and uh, gave a very generous contribution uh, to the show. So thank you very much, Blackbird Gaming. Thank you for tuning in and supporting what we're doing here. Yes, operations wise, uh, I think that there, there's two elements to it. One is just if you have specific pieces of equipment, just sort of seeing how everything looks relative to one another. I, I was just working on a layout yesterday, uh, a Canadian Rockies kind of deal, and being able to have the ability to uh, see kind of the atmosphere of a train pulling into a station and what that train looks like in relation to the station in relation to the background. And then secondarily, yes, to be able to look and determine uh, operations so how many how long your train length can be to practically work it and what kind of challenges you're going to run into what what are good operational challenges what are bad operational challenges and being able to balance all of that out so right now we're just doing the scrap yard here which i'm just trying to have a nice kind of blend of dirt and grass and different styles of rock to really give a sense of kind of a little bit of everything into the mix. And then looking from the track plan, this backdrop, we're basically just going to be doing trees and so forth. Um, because even when you look at it in Google Maps, it, it's, you, you, it's sort of industrial park, so one could build some building flats in there if you wanted to. Um, there's, there's kind of a number of ways you could do it. It, it. it partially depends on... I've been learning, thinking a lot lately about how when you choose to do a backdrop, there can be a lot more to that decision than meets the eye because if you're doing... Uh, let's see. Chain fence. Um, because 
I read an article in one of the recent model railroaders. Guy is doing a backdrop and it's entirely black. No blue sky, no trees. So he's doing uh, Jersey Central. Central New Jersey. That's it. Central New Jersey uh, route. And at first I'm like, why would you go with an all black backdrop? That's not particularly realistic. But his rationale for doing it was because it really centers. It's sort of like a, a theater black box. And that it forces the perspective to the it forces your audience your operators to focus on the buildings that are in the scene and the trains that are in the scene so it really isolates that i don't know if i'd ever take it as drastic approach as that although i'd be interested to test it with with one of these builds but it was an interesting thought that i came across so but it, sometimes doing the photo real thing is great sometimes it's nice to instead think about going with a, a different vibe because you're, you're going for a different kind of atmosphere. All right. And Dell's Metals is a brick building. So I've got this nice building here set to go. We're going to plop that in. And we're going to... It's a little bit too small for what we want. So what we're going to just do, the wonderful world of uh, train simming, we could just copy and paste that bad boy and kind of kit bash our own more to size those metals that we want. And do I want to put one on the side? That kind of sticks out from the fascia. So that gives us a good reasonable placeholder. If you want to go with the distance and learn 3D modeling and you actually want to put your buildings into a sim, that's, that's a great way to go. But that said, the benefit with Train Z as well is being able to just go to the download station which has literally thousands of items of rolling stock and scenery and just pick uh what pick something that's close enough and oftentimes that could go, do the trick or you could kind of pick something and then kit bash it like we've done here do they have cranes in there nick yeah what kind of crane you got in mind oh I, they just the big boom cranes they had like two you know a bunch of them uh let's see what i've got so um oh like the the cranes that are on rails that kind of thing no no they had um you know just the just the the cranes that that run on their own tracks you know in the yard in the uh, scrap yard that you know would you know they're they're boom cranes so they they you know they Gantry elevate so, so they can get yeah so they can get up above the big piles of metal yeah, sure. We we could uh, place a couple of those down. Um, so we've kind of got two areas here. We've got this. Now I'm going to use north and south relative to the layout. That might not be geographically correct, but it'll help me to, to think through what we're going through. So kind of on this, um, we've got this north bit before the grade crossing and then this south bit. So are you thinking one gantry uh, per side, essentially? Well, no, that I wasn't referring to that like a like a boom crane, like one that has the you had it up there a moment ago. It was, uh, you know, it's got the tank tracks type thing and the oh okay, um, um, tank tracks. Gotcha. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably have one. Earlier when you were scrolling through, I saw one. Yeah. Right, right there, right there. Uh, you might be on a little bit of a... Oh, a crawler crane Oh, we're on like a this? delay. We're, we're on a delay, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that might be a little bit older, this one that I have up that, that's a uh, crawler crane. I'll put down some scrap cars while we're waiting for the delay to get caught up. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a nice crane, but <laughs> that's way too big for what we're going for here. Oh, that, not really. That looks that looks pretty good. All right, then we'll go with that. Um, so I'll delete <laughs> that gantry crane, and now we've got the crawler crane that could be roaming around. And let's see, 
else we want to put in here uh, as we can't do wrong with a, a pile of tires or two. And this is the type of thing that off stream we might spend a little bit more time on too. One can, one can have a lot of fun with, with going crazy with the super detailing with this stuff. Um, well, I'm, I'm amazed Nick that you can do this while talking. Uh, you know, I would, my brain would shut down. Uh, it, it's practice. It's practice. It's, it's patience on the folks with you guys, uh, watching along and knowing that it is a little bit tricky, uh, to, to, to do these two things at once, but the key is to just ramble and hopefully be saying something of interest while rambling. <laughs> that, that's, that's what it boils down to is just, is there some piece of nugget I could do there? <laughs> I mean, fortunately, yeah, I have a lifetime of experience of talking to myself, so that isn't too... <laughs> I'd get myself in trouble. Uh, so, so while I'm uh, while we're we're uh, working on this scene, uh, Scott, maybe talk if you could tell the audience a little bit more about your background of, uh, like, did you grow up in this area, um, and what led you to choosing uh, this particular branch to model? Uh, because yeah. obviously I'm sure you have a lot of experience in rail fanning in your region. Um, a little bit, not too much. No, I grew up in Northeast Iowa and then I went to college at uh, Iowa State, which is in uh, the central part of the state. And then, um, you know, got married, had children and raised a family. And now I'm at the age where I'm starting to slow down and, and uh, the kids once they were basically out of the house was my opportunity to build my first model railroad, which I'm, I model in HO scale. And um, yeah, like I said, the, the Iowa interstate was always an, an interesting railroad to me. And it's about a mm, couple hour drive to go rail fan it. And I've done a little bit of it, not too much. I've got other Iowa interstate friends, um, both, individuals who model it and others who just rail fan it. And so there's a lot of resources that I have available for understanding the different aspects of the railroad. And, 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 uh, so that, that, that was really what got me interested in it. And besides that, what runs through Iowa is the BNSF and union Pacific. And I wasn't interested in those at all. So, um, so that's, that's, again, the Iowa interstate connection. And then I, I enjoy operating at a very relaxed pace, you know, just within yard limits, you know, no dispatcher. I mean, I, I, I would enjoy that if I had an opportunity on a bigger layout, but I like the laid back operational approach of a branch, just out and back, switch the industries, you know, have a good conversation with your friends, that sort of thing. So that's, that's what branch line railroading means to me. That's a good way to look at it because I do think that there is that our, our model, that our personalities are reflected in our modeling preferences in terms of what we choose to model and how we choose to model it. Uh, whether we're, we're going something really big and audacious or whether we're doing something um, smaller or more compact, how, how much we go into the nitty gritty with the details, whether we care about detailed operation or whether we're sort of, eh, just, just let it flow, let it ride. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, there's no wrong way to do it. But I think that you're recognizing for you that what you're looking for is a nice sort of a relaxed atmosphere so you're not worried about timing of trains and meets uh everything goes at the pace that you're driving it at that seems like a really good approach to take mm -hmm. i'm i'm i joke with my friends that i'm the kind of modeler that just gets excited about watching an, an engine couple up to a couple cars so <laughs> and so uh, how because it seems to me, because when I when I was doing re research for the Milan branch, I saw your name crop up a, a number of times uh, with a bunch of prototype photos as well. So I, I'm guessing you've done your, your fair amount of, of chasing of, of trains on the branch over the years. Well, the, the branch is a good three hour drive from my home. So, um, no, I haven't 
actually I haven't. Um, again, I just have friends who've who've done it, and um, there's there's one individual named Eric who's a friend, and he lives in Milan, and he's a a huge rail fan. He he and photographer, so he chases trains all the time. So he's really <clears throat> got a whole catalog of of the Milan branch and uh, he actually since he grew up there went to school there high school grade school and high school you know he he remembers many times seeing the 250 the little SW 1200 you know plying the rails and moving up and down the branch so it was a favorite of his so I again I have that resource where I can just go to Eric and say you know what do you think about you know this area in terms of imagery and and then he can help me out in that regard. Good to have local. Co I think I know which Eric you're talking about because, um, so I, I like, I love the Iowa interstate, uh, but I have reason to be biased because Iowa interstate has been a client of mine for streamline and media. So if, yes. you, if you go to their, uh, the corporate website, which I think is IISRR.com, uh, or just Google search it. Uh, on their main page, you'll see a video that's uh, a business spotlight, uh, just kind of showcasing uh, their services and network. Uh, that is a Streamliner Media production. Uh, uh, that was that was a very fun thing to put together. They were very great, great company to work with because leading into the project, I, I said, if you want something comprehensive, this is the kind of access that I'm looking for to be able to get all these different sides of your operation. Uh, they were very accommodating. Uh, they gave me a, a designated person to work with to help coordinate things. Um, they were very good. So I'm, I'm very heavily biased in my appreciation of Iowa Interstate, but they honestly seem like a company that really loves to be a railroad. Uh, in a day and age where not every railroad seems to love to be a railroad, but Iowa Interstate really takes pride in what they do. They they wash their locomotive. The detail that gets me, they wash their locomotives every 90 days. So when the they're doing the, the 90 day um, servicing, they're also washing them. And that's, that is a testament to kind of a love of being a railroad. Um, even in their their corporate offices in Cedar Rapids, you go into their lunchroom and there's this really nice dramatic mural by this railroad artist. I forget his name. I think it wanted to say his first name was Tom. He he did a lot of work for um, EMD back in the '80s, and so they commissioned him to do artwork up there when they just uh, bought the Jeevo locomotives. So that was that a real great? treat of an experience getting to, to work with them and see well, all these different sides of the company. Although I, <laughs> of all the things I did see, the Milan branch was not one of them. Uh, I was admittedly more tethered to the mainline action. Well, and your video was spectacular because I watched it several times and I shared it with my other Iowa interstate modeling friends and they were all impressed. Um, I think that might have been, if I if I was a betting man, that might have been Tom Daneman. Uh, uh, Tom. No, 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 not because I, I know, so I I don't know Tom personally, but I, I'm familiar with Tom. But no, it, um, we're talking somebody who does oil paintings. Like this was this wasn't photography. This was oil paintings. Um, the same artist did an oil painting of the Ace Three Thousand concept engine. It was like a steam engine that was designed in the 80s with, with a diesel locomotive cab. Um, yeah, I, I'd have to go, I'd have to do a bit of Googling. If you can find it for me and to put it in the comments, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, as I say, search for a Tom that's an EMD artist. Uh, you should well, Tom, Tom, Tom Daneman's actually an extremely talented painter as well as a photographer. So he's... He is, He's, but this is an yeah. older, this is an older gentleman. I think he, he passed away some years ago. So not, yeah, I'm, but it's I funny you. you mentioned Tom though, because actually uh, about a year ago, we built a track plan that he designed on this show uh, based on the Montana rail link of which nice. I know that both he and his brother are huge fans of. So 
pick for we're getting close to kind of getting the broad strokes of the scrapyard and now we're coming up on i'm going to say this is 31st street yeah 31st street so this one's paved uh but yeah very yeah, i would understand it's a good company uh and certainly if you're if you can make it, uh, there's a number of reasons to rail fan in Iowa. I, I feel like Iowa is sort of an underrated rail fanning state because you've got Iowa, you've got plenty of Union Pacific action, you've got Iowa Interstate, uh, main lines going through there. You've got some nifty little side things too, like the I'm in an interurban kick right now and the, the Mason City stuff, um, mm, Iowa Traction. That's, that's great. Yeah, I'm going to be up there tomorrow, so I'll be able to check it out. You know? Oh, nice. I, I, one of a future, future build that I want to do on this show is a sort of, I don't know that I want to do that one specifically. I would if I had a track plan for it, but I'm thinking that I want to do something inspired by it, a, a sort of 21st century modern railroad that just so happens to be using uh, Baldwin steeple cabs. That's my vision for it. Uh, let's see. That sounds great. Hey, uh, Nick, it, dare I ask, um, is the track set in place or can you vary that? Uh, um, we can vary it. Uh, it's, uh, we'll vary it. I, I did build a session for uh, a play session, but if we need to replace the cars, I still have the instructions. Um, what, it, what do you want to modify here? Well, um, since you're basing this off of that original Google track plan that I, that I, you know, I stitched Google images together for the track plan, but the actual model trackage is more, excuse me a second, is actually more, um, closer together so that like the runarounds are longer, you know, the, the track is, is, uh, you know, extended, I guess. Okay. So uh, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I, I don't want you to build a lot of scenery and then go, oh, yeah, that track should, that that runaround should be longer. Sure. Uh, so what do we need to modify? Well, I could, uh, I don't know if you want exact dimensions, but just generally speaking, like the, the turn, the turnout, turn, turnaround, runaround, um, the first one there, mm -hmm. like you could, you could pull that second turnout, uh, pretty close to the to the Dell's metal like where the yep. uh, gotcha. like where the where the ground is just past the building there you could have the switch points in that area yeah I see what you're saying so there's a slight curve so we'll we'll keep that and then we'll push this switch back further toward that um, yeah and if you don't want to do it now if it's if it's easy because I know you have that that ballast a substrate so maybe it's easier to do it later uh no that it's pretty easy to do it right now okay and then we'll we'll modify the the track the terrain underneath just to make sure that looks nice uh, that was pretty close anyway i just didn't i just didn't want to is that a is that a better length for it now i mean it's you know we could always um we can fine tune it later yeah we can fine tune it later just to, for the folks at home just to kind of give you sense of uh, when I import the track plans, um, the I'm importing an image. So if you give me an image, that's what I'm importing. That said, if you have kind of a rough drawing and we need to tweak the dimensions later, that's not a problem because we've got built-in rulers here. And you'll see what these rulers do is they give us uh, the actual dimensions in whatever scale. So right now we've got it set to HO scale. So we know that that side is six feet. So when Scott goes back to his layout later and we're, we're fine tuning this, he can say, well, actually it's uh, six and a half feet and we can modify that accordingly. So there's a lot okay. of flexibility with what we do with these. Uh, uh, no, not deleting that. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility with that, but yeah, we can, we've, we can and we will. Um, is the the Sarah Leesper? I, I think I got that to the right length. I was able to fit three cars in there, um, three fifty foot ACF hoppers. So um, yeah, that's 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 really my only concern is that, and we, and again we can do this later, but just getting those dimensions on the runarounds and not so much the the spurs. Yeah, like that Sarah Lee, you can extend where it where it curves 
back parallel to the backdrop, you could extend it almost all the way to the backdrop where the backdrop occurs. Okay, so we'll throw that back there for now. And that yeah. works. But it looks like it's easy for you to modify it later and then we can get those exact dimensions. Since I am gonna use it to, to um, work out uh, op sessions, you know, it'd be nice to have the, the proper length so that I can get as many cars into like a runaround as I can. Yep, just th th you can send those to me later and then we'll get those honed in there. That's great. So now on to the Sara Lee plant. So what does this uh, Sara Lee plant manufacture? You know, it's bake. Obviously, it's bakery goods, but I don't really know what they what they made in there. Uh, probably my favorite desserts, you know, so. <laughs> that would be kind of interesting to, to, to buy something and, and know that it, it came off uh, came off the freight car, so to speak. Um, I mean, it seems to be too that with some of these places, you could honestly, especially with something like Dell's Metals, you could probably, I, I don't know if you, and maybe you've already done this, but you could call them up and just say, hey, so I'm doing a model railroad that involves your thing, and I just want to get it as accurate as possible and ask them, you know, how often they get car loads. I mean, if they're a little wigged out, you know, so be it. But I, I think some places, especially the smaller you know, industries, might be kind of, uh, might find that kind of cool that uh, what you're doing is replicating what they do for a living. Yes. It's interesting in the chat, you've got some guys that uh, lived in the Quad Cities. Jeff actually works in Milan. Interesting. Oh, well then, Jeff, if I'm doing it, then you can attest to if this is getting the, the right look and feel of things. Because it's interesting that, yes, we're, we're in a city, as I'm looking at the branch, but uh, at the same time, they're there's a lot of uh, interesting nature breaks and we'll see that especially once we get to rock river uh which is going to be particularly fun to detail uh so right now i'm looking at the I'm looking at the sara lee just to which is interesting because it doesn't show it as sara lee on google maps it shows it as statewide tire but that must be one of their tenants so we've got some track uh, embedded in the street we've got a parking lot between the tr the between the two tracks so this is just basically all concrete. Okay. Yeah, this is all concrete. So we'll yeah, and, and Sarah Lee's defunct now. It it, uh, it uh, closed. and Yeah, so that's why you saw something else. So caveat to that, you could call and ask the businesses that are still open <laughs> what their operations <laughs> look like. Uh, maybe I'll have somebody who was there long enough ago that they'll remember what it was like in the early 2000s. And some places it may not have even changed that much. Depends on the business. Okay, we're going to even raise that. But we are going to raise this. Now, it's it's interesting how you're building this, Nick. Like, you're switching back to different, back and forth between different modes. Describe some of that that you're doing. Like, it, like this this grid here. What what are you trying to do now? Good question, Scott. So, uh, what we've got, so there's, We've got layers. We'll start with that. So just like Photoshop, we've got these different layers to work with. And the advantage of layers is just like you have with Photoshop is to be able to see different things. Uh, so you can use it in a multitude of ways. The way that we're using it here is that I've imported your track plan as an image. That image is essentially a big object that fills the entire tile, as you can see here. Um, and you can see how it's filled this tile because this tile is empty and it just has our basic grid. So this is a great way of me being able to outline roughly uh, where where buildings should go, track, uh, and a little bit of texturing. But as you can see, we can't see both at the same time, so it is flopping between the two. So this is just a static image that I'm using for reference. And when I was laying the track for this last night, it's basically just like connect the dots. So uh, being able to just see, oh, the track goes here and place it uh, through uh, along those lines, straighten, add straights, add curves. Um, once we've got that in place, then I'm switching to this. So the grid is the default ground texture so this is a texture 
Uh, and I can demonstrate that by then painting over some of what I did previously. And you see it goes back to being a grid. Yay for the undo button. So the grid is a great way. These are five meter real world scale. Well, five meter is the small square. And Ten meters are the yellow squares. Real scale. And these are the points by which we can raise and lower individual points uh, for doing mountains and scenery like that. Uh, fortunately, yours is, is nice and flat, so I'm just doing little undulations just so that it's not completely flat. Uh, just adds a little bit of variety. Uh, that said, what we're doing over here is just the track I've set to a specific elevation. So when the track is highlighted by a white circle, if we manipulate the terrain, the track goes with the terrain. But if the track has been set to a specific height, it will remain at that height. So that is great for being able to embed the track into the ground, which is what we're doing here for this uh, concrete portion. Was learning the program, what was the learning curve like? <laughs> the learning curve has been a 20 plus year process, uh, but not not a constant one. I So I've been doing train simulation for 22 years. I got Microsoft Train Simulator back in 2001 and trains with a Z, my first copy of that was 2002, 2003 thereabouts. So it's, it's a lot of just playing around. I mean, initially playing around in 2001 in my teen years, uh, in my preteen years meant just, oh, I can crash trains digitally and I don't have to clean them up. Um, and then as one gets older, one's tastes uh, evolve shall we say and so the the trainsy route building thing i i've i've played trainsy on and off since 2002 2003 but it's been in the past three or four years that i really started to delve into it and uh discovered that i really enjoyed building these layouts i got into it because i think that it's surveyor mode what we're in right now i do believe it is the simplest of the all the offerings that are out there if you want to build and just get going with it i think this is the easiest um but that said once you've played around with it you you learn the basics and then it's just the more you do it you learn the the shortcuts you learn certain tricks to oh how how do i get my track work to look smooth and how do I get bash buildings to look more like this or, or be able to extend my offerings? So mm -hmm. I had just a lot of play, just a lot of playing around and, and experimentation. Gotcha. It's fun. It, it, it really is a lot of fun. I, I got back into this thinking, okay, there's, because I see a train layout and think, okay, I want to build this train layout. I want to play with this. And that's why I'm doing this. And then I would see another train and I would go, okay, no, 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 now I need to build this one. And then it finally dawned on me, maybe I just really like building these things as much as I like playing with them. And uh, so I've, I've, I've really been delving into that, especially with the model railroads, because they are, they're nice bite-sized projects. I've done a prototypical route the Whiz Beach and Upwell, which we did a live stream of that in January, which you can check out. But uh, there's something really nice about being able to, to have a build that takes, you know, something like this. We're going to, we may not finish this on the stream, but this is going to be a matter of a few hours. Um, and it's just taking a bit longer because talking and, and building a route is an interesting challenge. But um even a larger layout, like let's say 30 by 30 in HO, maybe one to two months. It depends on how detailed it is as far as, uh, as far as if it's a city, do you have a lot of buildings and streets or uh, is the terrain kind of complicated? Is the track work complicated? Mm -hmm. Details like that. I got you. Yeah, that looks... Okay, there we go. I'll have to look later and see if that's prototypical. But that'll at least get us going for the time being. 
And then here on 18th Street, I'm going to guess we probably have just old-fashioned signs. I'm going to go to Google Street View, which reveals... Oh, we've got actual uh, crossings for that. So I'm going to place those down. Yeah, I don't know what, if you want me to comment on specific details now or later, because we uh, could always do it later. Oh, uh, by all means, uh, now. I mean, I'm going to... Tr- Let's see. I want to try to get as... Uh, we're at 750. I want to try to get as much of this detailed as possible, but we also... This is the more tricky stuff. But feel free to comment. We can. Uh, I'm more than happy to fine-tune things as we go. Well, like the, the uh, crossing there, the grade crossing, that... What they have there are those um, those uh, concrete pads. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yep, we can switch that out. Which is a good question, Nick. Like, how detailed... Like, when you're building a plan for a customer, do you... Do, you know, I'm a designer by trade, and mm-hmm. when a when a client gets, sometimes it can get a little overbearing when somebody is so attuned to making a lot of changes and and a lot of the details. Is do you do you get that? Now this is a loaded question, obviously, but do you get that same feeling sometimes because or are a lot of railroad customers you know they 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 know what's there they want to get specific details and then once you once you get it as close as you can it's done but it is just representative you know it doesn't have to be like dead on accurate yeah it depends on what people's goals are so if some somebody might be looking to do uh they just want it for train z um and they're looking to play with it in in the sim. Maybe they don't even have any intention of building it in, in real life. In which case, then we're probably going to spend a little bit more time on the finer details of it, just because that is going to be the one way in which they're enjoying it. Um, somebody else, they may. S- somebody might say uh, just get it close enough just uh, my my focus is getting the track the scale accurate so i can plan operations some might even say don't worry about cedar just do track just do it as kind of a 2d skeleton thing like what we have going on here and and that just to be testing size or see how things are relative to one one another um seeing what the aisle space actually looks like things like that Mm-hmm. It really depends on how into the detail uh, the, the client wants to go. So for something like this, uh, what we're going for is something which is certainly good. It's going to be good enough that if you're playing it in the sim, it's going to look nice. Um, but because your end goal is testing operations and using it maybe for reference uh printing out references on your fascia um we might not worry about every single small detail it, it's really at your discretion and your budget that's it, that's right, kind of the right. general thing um, yeah for for me it's just uh, the most critical part and you know other modelers mm-hmm. might relate to this is is just the track length you know that's what we could fine tune Mm-hmm. Exactly. So all a matter of kind of working along. Uh, I need to get another warehouse. Uh, so we've got this building here, but this isn't served by your railroad, correct? Right. That's just uh, a, a building that's just there as a model, just for reference. And that they refer to that as the stockyards. Um, it's an actual stockyard stockyard that was right in the middle of town. So the the shed there was where the the cows would be when it was cooler out, and then they had those open pens too. Gotcha. Hence why this is the stockyard runaround. Yep, because as you know, the railroad names everything. 
Yeah, and those names won't outlast what is actually there in real life. It's like, how many towns do you go through that have a railroad street? Some still have the railroad next to their railroad street and others not so much. Right. So we're just looking for a halfway decent warehouse that we can place here. A lot of... The, the one interesting challenge I find when it comes to, to buildings in this game is just that uh, you get all sizes because obviously there's plenty of people who play this, uh, who build full-size giant roots on this, in which case then your buildings can be as large as you want. But finding buildings that can actually be uh, suitable for a model rare, that that's interesting. I've started getting into converting models from Microsoft Train Simulator. Uh, I don't know if that brick one's too ornate for what would be there. I'll see. I'll place that, but I'll see if I can find something a little bit more just gritty and functional. Uh, the actual building is is more like a just a steel Morton building. Gotcha. But but a, but a lot older. You know, mm -hmm. steel sides and steel roof. Yeah, that'd be that. That'd be a good place. That'd be a good one. This one here? The the white one. Okay. Yeah, we'll just put that there for the time being, and then we can swap it out later if we find something a little bit. Because I I know I can find something a little bit more modern warehouse than that, but that'll be a good start of things. Okay, this is where we get to zip along a little bit more, because this is just going to be trees and grass. So that, that'll that be a nice, easy backdrop to put in. Uh, and while I'm putting that in, uh, consumer aggregates is what we've got up here. So could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, let me see. You still there, Scott? Oops, I'm sorry. I had myself on mute. Um, yeah, consumer aggregate is uh, just like the name implies. It's just a uh, a dealer who deals in rock, <laughs> different forms, and and uh, they actually supplied, I think, the the majority of the Iowa Interstate's ballast. So seventy ton hoppers would would you'd see on the siding and 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 other types of hoppers pretty beat up ballast units yes ballast uh ballast cars don't get a lot of love especially if they're not in revenue service oh it rolls now, good now in trains can you super elevate the curves yes we can do that are, are is there some super elevation in this area yes okay then yeah um and we can apply that. So I'm just going to finish up getting this backdrop on here, and then you can uh, you can point out which areas have it. That's one of the things I really like about this. Uh, and and you could go you could go realistic on your super elevation. You could really give it that NASCAR feel. How little, how much you want. Uh, I, I knew a guy who uh, modeled the Erie Lackawanna, and he he was all for having that extreme NASCAR super elevation something tells me we'll be going a little bit more subtle here uh, but, definitely it was very subtle but we will it, i think it, it depends also on kind of whether you're lo looking at it sometimes you sometimes there's a little bit more functional element okay so we're going to turn off the base map so uh where should we be putting the super elevation really on on most of the curves there all the curves had very slight super elevation all right um so it, so like both of the curves uh for this or just the main for the stockyard runaround uh both of them had it i believe okay so what we do is we go into you have to go to, into the node information of the track. We set the degree elevation. We'll start off with three and see how that looks. We have to place a few of these for it to actually 
register. You, you set one point, you're not going to get it. But once you've set a few, then you'll, you'll actually see it in place. And we can also set a piece of rolling stock down to make sure that it actually takes. And three. What kind of computer power do you need for doing this on the fly? Do you, you have, you're using a PC? Yep. Um, so trains with a Z works with both Mac and PC. Um, you want something halfway decent. Uh, so mine just what does halfway decent mean? Well, for me, I've that means I have a dedicated graphics card as opposed to just a, a built-in graphics card, which you might have on some laptops, that kind of thing. Um, but you don't need the most advanced. I, I honestly, a decent decent graphics card and a decent CPU would be the way to go on that. Okay, so elevations in there. White seen a take effect yet. Um, I think it's there, but we can check that by placing a piece of rolling stock and we'll see if it's leaning or not. Oh, yeah, that's leaning. <laughs> uh, that's leaning a bit too much. Let's put it, but that's also a long car. We might uh, turn that down. So if we put an ACF, oh yeah, that's also really leaning heavily. So let's turn down the, the degrees of that to maybe just one. Oh, that's six. No wonder it became so heavy. So we're going to turn it down to three and make sure that that's good. And we can turn it down further if we need to. Okay. All right. Uh, that still looks maybe a bit extreme. So I'm going to take it down to like one and a half. But our super elevation is in there, as you can see. So we'll try 1.5, 1.5. And this is where being able to pre-visualize what you're doing is, is such a great thing because then if you're building something where you're kind of torn as to whether, oh, do I want to for an elevation, do I not? You can, you can build it in the sim and see if it's to your liking. Okay, that feels comfortable. Uh, wouldn't you say, Scott, that, I mean, we can see it, we can visually register it, but it doesn't feel like NASCAR. Well, yeah, you could even, you, you could even make it go even more, like half as much subtle, more subtle, in my opinion. Okay, then we'll just take it down to one. That's easy enough to do. That's, that's perfect right there, yeah. Okay, so, and then we'll just go ahead and apply that to all of these curves as well. Now, would the side into the aggregates have it? Or just the, the main? You know, I, uh, I don't think it did on the siding. Okay. On the model, I built it in just because I didn't want it to look strange. All right, then we'll put it in there just because I'm putting it in on these uh, points as well. And I think it gives a little bit of dimension because obviously on our models, they, they're they <laughs> HO scale models, N scale models. They're designed to take corners at high speeds, but well, as... it gives you dimension, gives a sense of that there's, there's more depth to your world. Right. Actually, I'm not thinking clear um on the stockyard runaround it's on the prototype it's actually straight so there's no obviously no elevation in there but the the siding or the runaround is lower than the but don't worry about that i mean we can just build the super elevation in okay so we'll leave it at that for now we'll get some more trees placed in the background just to get this build up and then we'll go to consumer aggregates which fortunately pretty straightforward that it's just going to be a big rock big old rock pile and that's a dead-on front loader that they use excellent that's what i saw because some with some of these I'm, I'm one of my projects that i'm working on right now is actually the florida northern railroad uh in ocala florida 
And that one has some very interesting loaders for its setup, uh, loaders and unloaders. But this one feels just more, just more like there's a front loader, there's a pile, and go. So you have, okay, now we have Jason Clocky in the chat, and Jason actually worked the branch. So he, oh. if he's going to watch, uh, we can pick his brain. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us, Jason. And uh, yeah, man, we're getting all sides of it now. So we've got we've got the guy who's modeling it. We've got the guy who's running in real life. Um, so that is uh, that is really cool. I love this community. I love how all these different sides of what we do come ac uh, Jay across one another. Jay Jason's saying there wasn't any super elevation, but I'm, if that's the case, I'm, I, I'm corrected, but I'm also going to take a liberty because it looks better on the model. Plus, uh, I've seen some photos where it looked like there was some slight super elevation. So there may be some variation. All right. Well, we'll leave it in place for now then. Yep. That's easy enough to do. Okay. We're going to go with a denser grass as our base. So the way I like to do my texturing, I, I like to start with a base and I'm going to give everything that base because then we're getting rid of the grid and uh, we know everything is covered. Uh, so right now this is the grass aggregate as opposed to the rock aggregate uh, loadout. Then we then we mix it up because one grass texture looks too repetitive. So now we, we go in there and we, we paint it and we may paint it with two or three different just so that it, it looks a little less monotonous. But I'm not liking that texture quite as much here. So we're gonna try, yeah, I like that lighter grass a little bit more. And then maybe we'll throw in some dirt to kind of make it a little less lush before we go in with the ballast and the rock and all that kind of thing. But that way we get a little, nice to have some variations as well, color variations, kind of good way to sort of designate super uh, different zones or regions of your layout. So here we're going with a lot of browns uh, and grays, and then you could kind of transition out of it. And it's a subtle thing that this could apply to your your full scale layout as well, is that we, we tend to focus on things when we're modeling. We focus on buildings, we focus on land forms. Those are all good, but the way that you can direct people with color as well, it, it's much more subtle but there's a lot that you can do with that and you can explore with that. And that's just as simple as what bottles of Woodland Scenics you reach for if you have your own homemade mosses or materials that you use. Okay, so a little bit, little bit of brown and then we're gonna go in, do some ballasting along the main just to see what that looks like. I have a feeling I'm gonna Play around with that base color a bit, but obviously we're also going to go in heavy on the ballast. Now, uh, are you looking to have, I'm guessing you're going to want some kind of piles around here, uh, around the aggregate yeah, the, loader? Yeah, the piles are, uh, they're going to be modeled basically from the center of the curve radius on the spur there, on on this side, on the, on the fascia side. Okay. Uh, all the way to the end loader. Uh, well, no, I should say half, halfway. So it seems to me, if that's the case, now uh, is your fascia going to remain level with the track though? Because yeah, not it's all it's all it's all flat except for the river. Okay, so you're going to have essentially just little little piles then. And there's no grass between the spur and the line. It's all rock. Okay. And we'll we'll go with a denser rock for that, like what we used over here. Yeah. Just because then we get some nice variety. Um, but would there would there be any piles between the spur and the and the main or uh, just uh, no? That side? that's that's all just flat rock. Okay. So we're going to get some piles of rock because train Z 
of the many things it does really well, uh, small landscaping contours are tricky at this stage. There is a Surveyor 2.0 that's being developed, and that's going to make it a lot easier to do things of that nature. Uh, but until then, we, we often have to use objects to replicate these other elements. So we've got these... So, like, when, when you drop the object in, Nick, then do you pull it up to make a pile? Uh, this is... No, this is just a... You can see I've lifted it off the ground here uh, to give a sense of what it looks like. So I could make it smaller if I wanted to, and I might so that I could use the same object in a few different ways. But no, it, it doesn't... It's, it's not a scalable object in the sense that it grows. It's only scalable in the sense that you can move it around. Uh, that said, typically people who create scenery items, they might create several different versions so that you have different textures um, or different sizes. I'm just looking to see through what I have here installed at the moment. I mean, that's kind of big. Pile of scrap. Oh, well, that's something I'll put back here just so we have a little bit more variety with our scrap piles. Yeah, um, now, a, a lot of those piles, they they would overlap each other so it it made um what's the best way to describe it you know kind they, of cascading hills essentially right yeah but they were right like if you took two of those piles that and you just um cut them together you know take took one pile and pushed it into the other yep. pile yeah yeah we can do that um and i'll probably try to do some grocery shopping, uh, which is what I call going to the download station and, and installing additional assets uh, off stream. Uh, and then we'll have a little bit more to work with than just this one shape. But this one shape gives us at least a starting point for being able to replicate what we're going for here. And we'll rate or we'll raise the height to slightly different sizes on these so they're not looking too white as uniform oh that's looking pretty good yeah there we go and it's kind of serves as a nice view block as well depending on how you structure the piles because so much of what we've got here uh, and that's going to be a little bit less true because we're about to have a view block with the trees here um but with with scenes like this to have buildings and things that occasionally go in front of your train great way of adding depth if you're always seeing the train then it, it it feels like everything's kind of a rolling screen behind it but by having buildings and some foreground objects as we do here then it gives the sense that oh this train is traveling through a world that exists beyond what has actually been modeled uh and then uh will there be a buffer stop at the end here or ties or, or some type of track end here at the end of the spur it's just some haze stops. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. We'll we'll just drop those down. Okay. So there's our aggregate spur. Now we've got some of the in between. So, uh, which isn't much. So looking at the map, um, at, which is to say, looking at Google Maps, uh, what's kind of interesting is that there's actually two river crossings so we've got uh the rock the first part of rock river crossing then we go over this little peninsula then we have a second rock river crossing um are you is there a specific one of those that you're modeling or you're kind of just doing an amalgamation of both i combine both i use um the one has a spill dam up river mm-hmm and I model that with some ambient sound. And then I, I also model the, the, a bit, the point of the island that's in the river on the second crossing. Oh, okay, yep, I, I see that little point. Um, and I think that probably is gonna appear in your, your Google map images. Oh, yep, I see that, so right in the center of the bridge here. Yep. We will, we will replicate that. So, we'll turn that off for the moment. We'll get some 
trees going here. And you can tell me if you think it's too much in the way of trees, but I'm inclined to... I like the idea of having something that separates these areas a little bit more, which even which is ironic because actually the, the aggregate spur does touch where the bridge is at, but it seems like a good opportunity to have a, a nature break, but we can take that out and just make it grass if you prefer. Um... I wasn't following you there. Say that again. Okay, so uh, this area that we're working on right now, obviously we're, we're, we're putting trees in the backdrop. Um, for the foreground, we could put trees as well to, to kind of separate the two. Um, not necessarily a ton because you do have a switch there, um, but just a couple of trees to give a sense of looking into the scene. Yeah, I have some uh, trees that are... There's trees all along the bank of the river, so like that that bigger one you put between the track and the fascia, if you move that toward the river. Um, okay, like that? That would... Um, I've moved it a little bit towards the river. Grass. I got that right. Yep. Cool. Yeah, the, the, there's... There's there's more pile of rock actually around next to that curve, so those trees could be up against the riverbank only. Okay, uh, let's. All right, in that case, so then what I'll do to fill this out, I'm putting in some grass. So let's do our landscaping for this now. Now the bridge on this, I, I've given the. Well, there are a ton of. Uh, different assets uh, available for train z uh, for uh, anyone to download for free uh, which makes root building really uh, tremendously fun i could not find this specific bridge model uh, uh, so what i've done is I, i've put in a a more typical um uh warren trust but i i'm wondering if you could talk about what the prototype bridge is because the, the lat it's a lattice trust correct it's a lattice steel truss, yeah, built in the, I think, 1890s, 1880, 1890s, and they're still in use, which is unbelievable, but they are. They are gorgeous, but they are, and they are rare, hence why I don't think I've ever seen one, and I was not able to locate one for use in, in Train Z, but. Uh, I'm, sur I'm surprised Train Z doesn't have like a, like a, a Warren truss that has a flat top though that because that one's got a curved arched top we could do a flat top that that we can do uh let me just look that up um in terms of our trusses um and there's actually two spans across there nick i don't know if you can compress them but if not you know one oh, there we do. go this is much this is a better approximation so we'll put that in here instead um yeah there's fortunately the, and what we could have done with that bridge too is we could have split it in two as well it, it depends on the the length it's it depends on how it's been modeled but there's ways to customize these assets to do what we want we're gonna apply the vertex height because you can see that the track was starting to dip into the land which is not what we want to have happen and so now we've got the bridge and we're just connecting the track to it and we're yeah that's in. that's a pretty good representation for you know what you for have a available. placeholder and oftentimes that's the case uh, with trains with a z is that you you're talking placeholders uh, if you're a 3d modeler if you know how to use blender uh maybe you already know it a bit because you're doing uh 3d printing then great because those skills carry over to train Z. There's there's some things that you you have to learn that are specific to the simulator. You have to also do texturing, which you wouldn't have to do for your 3D printing. But the advantage is that you um, you can then make some buildings that are are custom fit to what you're looking for. So uh, an example uh, of I'll show off a, deviate a little bit just to show off what we could do as far as when you start to know a little bit more about 3D modeling. Um, I'm going to search mill front. So I, for a different layout project, actually for the Valley City Street and Interurban Urban Railway, which we built that last year in the stream, and I'm happy to let you guys know that it's available for download on greattrainlayouts.com. 
cool little ur inner urban railroad based out of Valley City, North Dakota. This was a building that I took from a larger 3D model and I, I removed all the bits I didn't need. And so now it's a building flat that I could fit in. Um, with the backgrounds of trains, you can often have buildings just stick out the back, but let's say I wanted it in the foreground. Well, I can just turn it around and now I've got this building that, um, and let's say I had a kit of that. So then I could actually see here's what this specific building looks like in this specific space. So yes, uh, at some point, hopefully somebody, because would model the, the lattice trusses, because that is pretty cool. We're going to build a rock base for this. So we've got a nice riverbed texture that we can go for. And that's going to be our base. And then from that, we'll add other larger rock textures. We'll put our water in here. And we'll put our little island. But we'll, we'll add the island last just because that way then. Uh, and we'll see if the water texture lines up or if I'll be using a spline. But once we've got the water in we can tell where the island should go oh no that's gonna work for us so one luxury we have by doing it uh in the sim is that we get to have uh water with reflection that also has uh, gentle moving waves so we're gonna drop that in there that's a bit of a light color so we go into the environmental settings and from here we could go to the water color Oh, not that slider. Uh, and we can just, we can make that water color whatever we want. Um, it is a bit see-through, so we'll probably add a spline just to make it a little less so. Because if we look on Google Maps, it's kind of got a brownish look to it. So we're going to add a river spline beneath that just so we don't see. Because right now, we see the, this is one thing that trains, if you, if you're modeling a, a larger body of water, then Trainsy's good at not showing you your, your your the the bottom of that. But for something small like this, uh, it tends to show it. So we have to use extra visual tricks, as it were, to get it to look a little bit darker. Do some more landscaping around that. And what would you say, Scott? Is that a good depth for, for the water? Should it be a little higher, a little bit lower? Um, yeah, the video is a little bit uh, on delays here. so I'll... Yeah, yeah. you could you know, let me know when you get to that part of the show, if it's looking as it should to you. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty shallow river, and it's the banks are, are pretty straight, you know? Um, and I'm modeling it when a, a lot of the tree reflections were showing up on the river. So it has more of a, a murky green kind okay. of olive drab look. Okay. I'm, I'm going to increase the greens and the reds a little bit. And then we could get a little bit of that color represented there. And there you go. That's, that's looking, looking much better. Good. Glad to hear it. And now... Let's do a little bit of adding some other PBR rocks. PBR procedural based rendering tech term. Basically, long and the short of it is that it gives us, when we're zooming in, these textures have actually a little bit of dimension to them uh, as opposed to being perfectly flat. So your older style of textures, let's see if we can find an older style of rock texture. An older style of rock texture would just appear and it would just be flat. So this one right here that I'm showing right now, this light brown rock, which was good for its time, but now these PBR things, they interact with the lighting shaders more in the sim and they just look better. Uh, what kind of bridge abutments do we have on this? Are they stone or concrete? They're concrete. Concrete, okay. And we'll add a little bit of that and then and we'll get those, and we'll get some more rock, and then we'll put those. Yeah. And a little bit of stone. We'll a little bit. How do you know when to 
stop rendering based on your on your customer's budget um it's just a matter so i i i i budget based on time so it's kind of factoring in i've done enough of these builds to be able to estimate how long something will take and ergo knowing how long each stage of that takes um what type of scenery i'm, I'm facing whether i'm gonna have because if i'm doing something that's a lot of mountains a lot of trees that's it's ironic it's easier to do something with a lot of mountains and trees uh, in the sim than it is with uh, a city with a lot of buildings and a lot of finer details so it, it it's just kind of being able to estimate okay what do i anticipate this will uh require um time wise and and understanding what the end goals are whether we're talking about something that's designed for regular routine play or if we're um doing something that's more just about a, a representation or a guide because in particular the thing that that i like being able to help people out with uh with regards to these builds is overcoming uh, analysis paralysis or just staring at that blank sheet of plywood and going what the heck am i doing what is this going to look like um i'm more than happy to do uh, track plans from the ground up as well but that said if you have the track plan and it's just what am i doing scenery wise especially if you're doing something that's not based on a specific area maybe it's freelanced in nature then my goal is to help you to be able to overcome that fear of well what if i don't like it by being able to see it in the sim and and know what you're aiming towards you can have those screenshots uh, on your basement wall or whatever wherever your train room is and be able to know okay this is what i'm going for and i especially when you get into th landscaping and things where <laughs> plaster and, and you don't want to have to redo it solely because you do it and then you realize you don't like how it looks avoid some of the, the do over work you know just watching you do some of this quick overlapping it looks like it could be a lot of fun you know because you have the experience of using the program for so long that you can do it quickly but it's 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 very intriguing it's like instant gratification because you're you're layering yes yeah it, it it really is a case of instant gratification because it doesn't it takes a while if you're super detailing a scene and really going in at it but in terms of i just want to get a sense that this looks okay it, um you're gonna know that within a couple minutes um because sometimes I'll be building a route, and even before I get to the texturing, I'll just look at the how the grid and the, the landscaping looks, and I'll be able to say, ah, okay, I like that, I don't like that. Um, it's really a great way of getting that feedback immediately and knowing this is, this is where I'm going with it. You know, I'm really surprised in the model railroading space, Nick, that there hasn't been some sort of um render artists like yourself who haven't been commissioned to do track plans you know for for publication because it would be a really neat way to do it well i that's part of my goal with what i do i I've, as long as i've been into trade simulation one of my goals has been to to increase the credibility of it because those who are already into train sims know that credibility already um which isn't to say you have to be super serious about it but i think that sometimes the the applications of it can be underrated because people can look at it and think well it's just a game and it, it is but it's all about how you use it um uh, so what we're doing with with being able to build these train layouts that's one case of it uh but also when it comes to historic preservation when we're trying to communicate the history of things as they used to be um but they're not that way anymore historically the way that we've done that are our books and images and, and that's always obviously going to be a key piece of of how we tell these stories 
but in terms of being able to to under better understand well what does it actually how did that railroad function what did it look how did these photos that we see as separate things how did they all look like when you could actually walk around that landscape and so that's been a continual endeavor of mine is to to illustrate how much of a tool train simulation could be for being able to to replicate this history and even with model railroads so some pieces of history some model railroads could do a really great job even where there's scale compression and all that kind of thing going on they could be really good at capturing the feel and the essence of something and maybe specific scenes and that in and of itself is a whole other layer of of storytelling and being able to do operating sessions where your 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 people your participants are becoming part of the world and having to think about the the operating challenges just like they would have in the real world 50 years ago or 100 years ago it's a lot of fun to explore um some of the questions in the chat well one one person Dextacuter 18 says oh this is the rmc project layout that that's right that this is uh it's i've got a series in railroad model craftsman now on the on the development of the branch line so that's what he's referring to mm. and this is this is the layout and then uh, jason asks what do you use for rolling stock and locomotives and this that question ties in nick to a question i had for you was you know that that you know when we're talking about layering scenery um some of the locomotives i've seen and some of the cars are exquisitely done in terms of weathering and and that sort of thing so Mm -hmm. are those are those locomotives skinned and weathered in in a program like blender or do they use something else so for blender is a 3d modeling program so that is what you create the mesh and the mesh is just the shape at the end of the day everything you look at in the world is just some combination of shapes and so and 3d modeling is absolutely an art and while i am starting to get into it more seriously i i would not classify myself as a a 3d artist in that sense maybe 3d artist in, in train z in terms of using these assets that people have already created but i i give immense credit to those who are building the meshes there's some really fantastic artists out there so the the first stage is you're building the mesh and then once you have those basic shapes you have a, a gray a very nicely detailed gray shape and so then it's all about how you apply textures on that. Um, what What's referred to as texture mapping. So you, you say, well, this shape is referencing this. It's sort of like unpeeling an orange. The, the typical challenge of how do you replicate uh, a globe and you unpeel the orange and it's a flat image. Well, same thing with 3D modeling. You have this, this combination of shapes. You have to map them to 2D textures. And those textures could be photographs. They could be, uh, there's online resources where you can find textures. Uh, and from that, then you're able to, to come up with the basic textures. Now, what we did for, for you, Scott, is that uh, you mentioned uh, having SW1200 uh, number 250. So uh, in that case, there is a pre-existing model out there of an SW1200. And so uh, I just took the liberty of reskinning that locomotive and you can see the results here. And we're gonna see that a little bit more in action in about a half an hour once we start playing with it. So that's a case where somebody's already created this model. In fact, uh, let me see if I can show what this one started life as. Uh, it started life as this. So this is a, a model that I downloaded from online uh, where you can see somebody's done a really nice job with the weathering of, on it and so forth. And so I just took these two dimensional textures in Photoshop that had already been mapped and I made sure that they were all this flat black and then I applied I, the, the stripes as separate layers and the text as a separate layer, the white stripe as a separate layer. 
So that is how, uh, so that's something that I'm. That looks pretty cool. In in the best, you know, as I say, I, I'm not a 3D modeler. So if you've got some really eccentric steam locomotive, uh, I, there's A, there's a chance that it may already exist for the platform. Um, but if it doesn't, uh, then we'll try to find something that's close enough to what you're using so that you have something to be able to to play test with that has the right feel, whether it be a switcher or mainline steam. There's a lot of but, stuff out there to get the right look and feel from a general could, standpoint. Could you drop a car in, Nick, just to show Jason what... And and you can get, like, the the assets have a lot of car t cars in there, but then you can go to third parties and purchase locomotives and cars too, correct? Correct, yes. So the download station has a lot of great uh equipment that you can download for free um so this uh diesel that you can see the iowa this reskin that i've done that's going to be packaged with the route so this uh, train layout uh once we finish it is actually going to be available for everybody to download on greattrainlayouts.com so you'll be able to play with this too uh so the the switcher will be available for download as will um this uh well this car isn't my work this is one that I downloaded for free from the download station. So this center beam flat car you could get uh, today uh, if you have the Train Z software. So center beams, and we'll see later, we've got some tank cars. And yeah, the, the 3D modeling on this, you know, the detail right down to the, to the hardware holding in the foot railings uh, is pretty, and the detailing on the couplers as well, pretty exquisite. So there's a lot of stuff out there that's really nicely done. And then as far as, yes, so there's some really great payware vendors out there that do some fantastic models that usually cost somewhere between 5 and $10 per model. Depends on what it is. And they do some absolutely phenomenal work. We've highlighted some of those on previous live streams. And great way of being able to uh, be able to... No, that's not the one we had got the wrong one. oh because we've got that um so it's a great way of being able to to play test different things and change your era so you could you might be modeling in in a diesel era but then you could just play with steam on it just for fun so we're coming up to the junction here uh this is a there's there's a lot going on between these two two lines so what are these two tracks that we have represented here what are they splitting off to scott well the one that's coming toward you is referred to by the railroad as the eagle sub and that in its present form goes to a lumber dealer that's not very far away um in the era i'm modeling the lumber dealer was owned by a company called Roberts and Dibdahl, but I think it's changed hands. Of, I think it got bought out. I'm also taking some liberty. They used to have a cold storage warehouse that they used to deliver reefers to, or at least I'm thinking they did. <laughs> so I'm doing a little proto freelance there, but um, so center beam flat cars and reefers will go down that, that sub and into that retractable staging that you see past the fascia. And then the depot there is uh, the signature depot. That's the Mylon depot. And the tracks that go turn to the west there, um, that's the Mylon runaround. And that just follows along 4th Street West. So there isn't much to that scene. It's it's pretty simple. And then the line ducks under the um, Interstate 280 overpass and then back into staging again. So that's the extent of the of that area. Nice. So, pretty simple. All right. So let's see what we've got. So um, here's that. Uh, we haven't put in the dig holes yet, which are the it's an object in train Z that basically just removes the ground for us but i i've toggled the ground off for the moment so you can see how we have this little hanging cassette coming off the edge of the layout here 
uh, and you can also see the curtains that are below the layout proper. So we'll add our, our grade crossing right over here. And we're gonna go back to this ballast aggregate. Well, actually we're gonna use an asphalt for that. So, And we're using that because I prefer using the spline roads, which are the ones that are sort of point to point, kind of like roads and flex track. But this is a corner and corners are icky in trains. Trains likes, trains he likes, uh, having room for things and having room for things is antithetical to model railroading so we're we're instead uh we're, we're gonna make that out of a texture and then we'll paint street lines on it using objects and then we're just gonna put in kind of a simple brown texture down for this uh for this staging area here just so that we we have a little something kind of denoting that yes this is staging um actually i like that one better we'll use that rock texture there we go okay and then we we'll probably be refining this further off camera but at least that way we have the great crossing in here um nick uh matt is asking will this live stream be available later Yes, uh, good question, Matt. Uh, all the live streams are available on the YouTube channel, uh, so uh, you can go back and, and rewatch things that you may have missed earlier in the stream. That is not a problem whatsoever. Um, and you can see some of the other streams that we've done uh, in the past with different train layouts and different builds. Uh, but I encourage you, if you haven't already, to subscribe to the, the channel because we do one of these streams every month, usually... We've kind of settled on doing the fourth Thursday of every month, but uh, that seems to be what works on a regular basis uh, with these. So yes, this will be available later uh, for, for you to be able to go back and take notes and see what you missed in the construction process. Do, do you have a pretty consistent clientele? I mean, are people reaching out and wanting to commission you on a regular basis? Yeah, uh, and uh, honestly, uh, e even when there's lulls in the action, then I, I find things I want to build for my own sake, and that's fun as well. Uh, I'm really grateful. Uh, as much as it's, it's nice to have a regular source of clientele, it's really wonderful to have a regular source of viewers. So thank you guys for, for tuning in and being part of this on a monthly basis because I see uh, quite a few names that I, I'm used to seeing uh, a number of times through. Uh, here before. Uh, good to see you again, J Train and Matt. Um, it's that to me is a lot of fun because this is the kind of thing that if I wasn't live streaming this, I'd be, you know, just doing this on my own. And that'd be fine, but it's, it's fun sharing the process of this. It's fun exploring it. It's fun talking with people. It's great having you on, Scott, to be able to, to talk to you verbally about what's going on but even when people are typing in this uh typing in their comments into the section and i can respond to them and sometimes they have some really great ideas as well as far as not to be patronizing you often have great ideas but sometimes they'll chime in and say oh have you considered this or uh why don't you try this approach to it and and i that's a it's a great way to collaborate because they'll think of things that i might not have done before and, and that's part of the fun of it same as if you were building, well, you are building, but uh, for those who are building model railroads and having somebody come over and you're, face, you're kind of going, well, how do I do this scenery? Like, how should I do this landform? How should I do this river? And somebody can say, oh, well, I, I'd recommend this approach. It's great to be able to have that level of collaboration going on. Uh, one small point, those cantilever uh, lights didn't, None of the crossings on the layout have uh, gates. Oh, okay. Was that a later addition? Because it looks like there's gates for this crossing in mm -hmm. present day. I to take a peek. Because I, I, I chose, because I, I was researching this yesterday uh, and getting assets ready. Um, I could use regular crossings. In fact, they're easier to set up that way would it have been uh just lit gates or uh, not lit gates but uh lights or just cross well, no they 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 look just like what you place there except no gates okay you know, it, 
it can lever it out. Um, I'm right. curious now. I'm going to zoom into Google and have a look. It, well, my, so part of what I've done here, and I'll probably uh, go back to this off camera to find the right asset for it, because um, there's different crossing systems in Train Z, and the crossing system I like to use because it will turn off the lights if you stop short of the crossing, just like it would in real life. Um has a limited number of crossings available. Mm. Um, but we could go, in the interest of being scenically correct, we could go with something that's more fitting to that. Um, but yeah, that might, no it, it might not have gates, but that might be why I chose that one. Um, so we'll use them as placeholders and then we can revisit that in a bit. Uh, going back to, okay, so we have trees, and then we actually have field behind this, but we're just going to fill this with trees, because the field isn't really visible through the trees anyway. A little bit of landscaping just to give it the, see, the, it, the nice thing, subtle landscaping, super quick and easy to do, but now when you're at track level, it's like, oh, the, the ground isn't perfectly flat. It's a little bit of depth. It's okay if it's flat, because the, the lines, except for the river, is pretty much flat true I, I for me it's it's that like as flat as the earth can be it's not like hit pencil perfect no ups and downs flat. like usually there's a little bit of something so i just do it because it gives it a little bit more dimension even where um and then we'll also yeah and we'll also add in some other tech ground textures and that'll help to give it a bit more sense of now you have cornfields in the assets too, right? Yes, because we're coming up on one, correct? Right. Yeah, so that is my plan, is we are going to do an actual cornfield. And cornfields are where the PBR textures really shine. We're going to see that. Um, I really like how the PBR makes the cornfields work. Okay, we're going to grab a little bit of that dirt, the uh, ballast aggregate, and just line the road with it just so it doesn't look something unnatural about it when it's just sitting on the grass and then you line it with dirt and you go oh yeah that looks right so just a little bit of grass here we'll refine that a bit later but this way we can just get some of the basic grass in place And there we are. Okay. So with that, now uh, were you wanting to put put the trees all the way up to the railroad, or or have it be um, a little bit open to the backdrop? No, on that curve there, there it's just a forest, and it's right up to the tracks. Okay, so we'll fill that a bit more. That is easy to do. Uh, the, the comparison of uh, the night and day comparison of doing uh, trees I in the sim where it's just oh copy paste copy paste versus in real life where it's like how many more armatures do I have to bend and how and I say that as somebody who's done that uh, mm. I, I mean now now that that the big island road right there just past the bridges mm -hmm. um, that's one where the road goes dips down and then back up so that's that's an area where you could get a little elevation change okay then what we'll do i i think down and up might be a little tricky to have look convincing the symbol so we'll just go for the down bit of that mm -hmm. and yeah that's fine yeah and i think that that'll that'll get a sense of it but it it's nice to be able to have that and then your cars coming into the scene can be kind of rising up so we've got that in place, and then we're going to lower this down. Are those weeds? Uh, grass. Mm. There's all sorts of different styles of grass we could use. That's just a, it's a spline grass, so it's really quick and easy to place. Oh, that, look, that looks really nice. Excellent. Glad that's what we're going for. So, just because that way then, oh, we've covered over the tracks. So we'll have to address that other point. But... 
that way it's a little something that says, oh yeah, even though we're in Iowa, even though we're in a really flat part of things, there's a little bit of sense of Earth going on. Uh, especially how it complements the, the river nicely. Okay, let's have a look at this field. So the outline that I'm seeing from here, it's like the forest kind of ends triangularly and then you've got the field pretty much to the I-280 overpass. Oh, and there's also a power line here, which I do have picked out. So we'll put that in place. Here is our overpass. This is what I mean about Train Z not liking anything that isn't perfectly square because unfortunately we don't get nice pretty ends to this thing. We, we kind of have to leave it sticking out a little bit into the aisleway as far as how it looks um, in, in relative to the fascia. But it gets our view block in. Yeah, that's nice. And then we get the height, and we use that height for both of the points, so we make sure the bridge is level. Yep. And then we've got the highway that's going to parallel next to it, and that's a four lane, but we're going to model... We're going to model it as if it were a two lane, because we're only going to see half the lanes. We'll go with a spline road on that. Ah. And we'll just use our same grass base that we've been using for this part, and then we'll cover over with the other remaining textures. So here is our grass. And this is timing perfectly. We've got about 10 minutes of build. We're, we're finishing up the scenery here, and then we're going to have a nice good play session, which I, I'm looking forward to. Um, I, I'm prepared to be roasted, as, a, as I usually am, for my questionable switching skills, because uh, if you thought it was tricky to do uh, root building and talking, it is. And then there's switching and talking, and that is a, a whole other layer of multitasking that sometimes is, is easier than, than others. Okay. We're gonna wind down the forest here so we'll get a couple more of these trees in places like so. Use a couple more of those to fill out that corner nicely, yeah. And then it pretty much winds down over about here. I want a couple of the yazin trees actually. Crazy, craving some yazins. Yazin, so the person who created these this set of scenery is Polish, so I believe this is Polish. But it, you, I find myself working so much in this sim that I just start referring to them as Yazins and Kusts. And I don't even know if I'm pronouncing them right. But you just get in the habit of it. Okay, I want a little bit more of that ballast to aggregate stuff. Let's see. There we go. Okay, just a bit more of that and a bit more of the light grass, uh, which is going to be this PBR grass mixed. Okay, and let's take a look at this field. PBR field. We have a lot of nice options when it comes to fields uh, in Train Z. And what's cool about the fields that we plant is that they do have actual dimensions. So we can see if we get down to ground level, you can see the the little plants and the little troughs, which is kind of nifty. Uh, if we go, the overwhelming color I'm seeing with this is yellow, so this is making me think it's some kind of hay field along this line. Yeah, more like this, yeah. So we're going to scale that down. We're going to change the direction it's facing so that it's facing parallel to the track. Uh, which you could do, you could do it parallel to the track. You could also do it at an angle. And maybe, maybe we will do it at an angle just so it it doesn't look too perfect in line with the track. Sometimes you want those imperfections. What what I'm modeling is is the uh, 
summer of 2003. So the, the corn is up and it's tasseled. Okay, so to do that, uh, we're going to see what this looks like in different seasons. So some of these textures, including the seasons or, or, or including the fields, are seasonal. So if we go into edit environment, there's a couple cool tricks we can do. Uh, we can change the season. So if we change the calendar date to, uh, let's say, August, uh, it will eventually... Okay, that is not going. Um, but it will change the textures for seasonal textures. Uh, depending on the asset, some assets are seasonal, some are not. Let's cycle through these different textures and see what's going to work best for us. So we've got, okay, so that's green. Now with something like corn, we might also have to put a spline on top of it. So I think that's what we're going to end up doing. Because a lot of these are just flat. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a bulk replace. So just kind of like if you were in Photoshop and you said, oh, replace this ground texture with this, or replace this color with this crown color. You could do that in Train Z, except in Train Z, you're actually replacing, uh, you could replace buildings, you could replace ground textures. Makes it a nice, quick, and easy way to experiment with different looks of things. Uh, and then, since you said corn, we're going to look at our corn splines. And we're just going to go with the widest one possible. Uh, but not that one, because that one looks flat and unconvincing. I have to find a good looking one. There we go. Okay. So we could go in and we can line these stalks up with the field texture. Now, the only trick is that we, oh, shortcoming is that if your field is at an angle like this, you kind of have to do a stair stepping effect with your with your corn. Um, you could run a, a texture along the front, but then you're sort of. It looks okay from the front, but then it looks maybe a little weird from the top. One of those sort of compromises one does as far as what's most important to you and, and the look that you're going for. Um, Let's see. Would be might actually be better off with that, and that won't take too long to add in. Take a few go rounds of it. But this one, we still have to stair step it, but it doesn't have to be quite as pronounced because the shape is smaller. So we'll just zoom back and forth with this. And while I'm getting this corn in, I again want to thank you guys for tuning in and uh, supporting the show. And if you want to go one step further in supporting uh, what we're doing here on, on Great Train Layouts Live, uh, one of two things you could do, either uh, head on over to patreon.com slash the roundhouse, where we have a link in the description. For as little as a dollar a month, you're going a long way to supporting uh, the work that I do, both through this as well as through the Roundhouse podcast. Uh, you get early access to these uh, these layout builds. You you get to experience them before anybody else does. In fact, right now, the root... Did I put up a root there? I, I want to say I put up the Lolita Mad River. If, uh, I've been, I'm in the middle of a move, guys, so you'll have to bear with me if I'm a bit scatterbrained on that kind of thing. But if I haven't, then within the next couple of days i will be uploading the lolita and mad river which is an ian rice track plan we built that uh, a couple months ago on the live stream and you're going to get early access to it uh, on patreon uh, and then the other thing is that if you're watching this and thinking gee that looks like fun uh, i'd love for for nick to take a stab at make it a, a digital mock-up of my layout, then I'd be more than happy to work with you. And you can uh, reach out to me through greattrainlayouts.com. And I'd be more than happy to help you out. Because uh, all of this is, is to have fun and learn things along the way. Now, here's our cornfield. And that was worth the few minutes it took of product placement to get that looking the way it does now. 
at this stage, I think the last thing I, I, I'm going to do for the time being, we're going to put our ballast textures in, and I think we'll just go ahead, drop a highway next to that, and then we'll, we'll get playing. How does that sound to you, Scott? It sounds great. Excellent. Let's do it. So we've got the have our ballast in there, nice and clean. Sometimes I make my ballast too clean. One can kind of roughen it up as one needs to, but I, I want to say tends to be pretty good about their infrastructure, even on their secondary lines. Okay, and then as far as highways, this is another one where. We want to use the splines, and we are going to use the splines, but we've got this angle coming in and out. It's awkward in the world of train feet, but I think we're just going to go for it because I like the look of that better. Uh, so we go for something like this, although that actually hangs out a little bit too wide as far as our highway is concerned. Maybe this will work. Yeah, let's go with this. Although maybe not 30 feet. Maybe 38 will be wide. Nope. Uh, 38 feet. And then we get sidewalk. But that doesn't have sidewalk, does it? Oh, it does have sidewalk. Okay. Then we'll go with that. Yeah, this angular. We might have to have it kind of what we'll probably do is have it just disappear into the gravel because we're gonna have to paint the road line separately anyway but that will be good enough for the time being just good enough for the sake of getting us up and running with this and being able to say hey there's a highway there that over just a wee spec more and we'll build up another piece of it and blend that into the ground and let's get that power line in place because that power line is a cool detail that I thought yeah let's place that there and get that along the track and then once it goes by the station now I'm in Google Maps and I'm looking, okay, so once it goes by the station, it, yeah, it parallels the road and then it crosses to the other side of the road and then it looks like it follows the track, the river, okay, if you say so, or in fact, it follows the, to the other road and from there, it goes to streets. Some of it continues to follow the track. But we'll put it there for now and then along. Yeah, we'll leave it there for the time being. Okay. So here we have it. Uh, still needing some refinements, a little bit of polish here and there. But we have the Mylon branch, as modeled by Mr. Scott Thornton, in Trains with a Z. So we can get that painted. Uh, and I think with that said, then we can probably just quickly drop some dig holes in here. Dig holes are the things that are going to make the, make the gray go away, and I think that'll should be pretty quick to add a few of them and that way we're going to have a nicer look overall when it comes to being able to, to play this it'll look more realistic uh, so one two three uh, oh we'll have to cheer that so we'll place one there there curves are tricky curves are tricky with big holes but we'll get the big ones out of the way and then we'll put some smaller ones into play. And then here. And here. But that way now we just don't have a lot as much of that ugly gray to look at while we're playing with the layout. And... 
Mainly I'm gonna focus eventually we'll we'll put up walls and this will look all nice and proper. But for the time being, I'm just gonna get it close enough so that we don't have these giant bits of gray. And then we'll start playing. I'm having to concentrate on this because I have to keep count so it kind of has that nice, keeps that nice grid look about it. Okay, so this is obviously, uh, do I want to put down a floor? Yeah, we'll put down a floor. That'll take all of one second. We have a separate layer that we're going to put the floor on because that way, if you wanted to toggle between different scenery items, then you have the ability to do so. Uh gonna go with something a little bit more what kind of floor you got scott uh scott it's uh it's a it's a dark gray laminate okay then we'll go with this dark gray here and we're gonna adjust the height and go minus 54 meters because again we're talking real scale meters on the height not show scale and then we'll put one more there adjust it for the same height and there we have it we'll do more of the polish later but now when we're playing with it we don't have to stare at all that gray grid which will be nice oh but we do need we should fix that little bit of where those uh poles are that's a little bit off Oh, and I know why it's off, because of that curving through there. So we're going to split that. So I'm happy enough with that to feel like, sure, let us say that is good enough for playtime. So when we come back, which is just going to be in a few minutes, we're going to get the trains fired up and we're going to have some fun and test the play factor of the Iowa Interstate Milan branch. So don't go anywhere here on Great Train Layouts Live.
and we're back here on Great Train Layouts Live. And as you'll see, I, I did a little bit of a wardrobe change. Uh, I actually meant to put it on earlier and then started streaming and thought, wait a second, I forgot that detail. But now I feel ready. You feel ready, Scott? Yep. Excellent. I feel like uh, it, it, this is going to be actually kind of interesting because uh, I feel like I'm going to be, this is going to be me being engineer and you're going to be conductor and it's just kind of telling me, telling me what to do or at least telling me what I'm doing wrong. Well, I don't know about that. We got some professional railroaders in the audience. They'll, they'll tell us both we're doing it wrong. <laughs> yes. Uh, we welcome your feedback. Your feedback is valued. <laughs> So let's see. Uh, so let's just do an overview of what we've got going on here. Uh, we've got some coil cars. Uh, and I need to bring up the track plan. Okay. So we've got some coil cars and those are going to be going to the steel warehouse, which is off of the um, mile and run around uh, over on the west side of the layout on the Andalusia sub is that? Yep. Okay. That's right. Um, we have a high cube box car loaded with paper uh, for. Uh, that one is headed to the it's Eagle going to sub. A, correct. Uh, no, that one's going to uh, the staging. That's that's a. Uh, uh, well, no, we it might be going to the lumber dealer. Yeah. Lumber. Okay. Yeah, that what I thought. Uh, we've got a uh, tank car of chemicals for Interstate Chemical. That's going to be going off uh, the Milan. Oh, I should let me. Uh, so I'll increase the track plan. The track plan is linked in the description, but I'll, I'll momentarily increase this uh, on the stream so you can better see it. So, uh, and I'll put the train over to the left side of the frame so you can see it more properly there. So these coil steel cars for. Uh, are going to the staging on the left. We've got the high cube that's going to the Eagle substaging. The tank car is going to Interstate Chemical, and uh, this lumber car is going to uh, Roberts and Dibdal. Dibdal, yeah. Dibdal yep. lumber. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there will be these two cars of scrap to pick up. Uh, two of these three uh, hoppers are empty. This one is still loaded. Uh, I'm probably blocking it. Two of these three hoppers are uh, empty, but this one's loaded, so we have to leave the loaded one in place. And we are picking up the rock. All right, not into it, but to do it. So I'm going to go back in, shrink this map down so it's not covering everything. And let's see how we do. Put that stream window up there, and we'll get underway. And uh, I will... Uh, let me know if uh, if you're not hearing Scott over the sound of the engine. Uh, I, I can play around with the sound levels on that a bit. So when you sent me the notes of this move, Scott, your first piece was to run around uh, the whole train uh, using this run around, correct? No, we were gonna pull. We were gonna pull the train and then grab those two um, bones that Bell's know. Okay. And then we were gonna go into the stockyard run around, and that's where we run around the train. Okay. We'll see if we can do that. We might have to do two separate run them around moves because I think this is gonna be just large enough for the cars we have. I don't think it's gonna be large enough for the additional scrap guns. We could really mess this up, Nick. <laughs> well, at least we're messing it up together. Um, it's model railroading. We can mess it up. <laughs> we'll do the street. I haven't programmed these crossings in, but in the final version, these crossings will actually function. Oh, I should put the headlight on. That might be wise. I have no idea if that's the right horn or not. I tried to find a video on YouTube of what horn it wore. 
but this is the horn that the model came with. It sounded kind of funky, so I went with it. Uh, if anybody knows, uh, your, your man, uh, uh, Jason, uh, out there, if you know what horn 250 had, uh, then we can, we can, uh, get that corrected for the release. I think it, I think it was in Nathan P5. Oh, okay. All right, so. Okay, so we got to slow her down. Well, we're on this delay. Is there a better way to do that, Nick? I mean. Uh, that, well, just take my word that I'm, my driving is okay. Okay, well, now you went past, we we're going to pick up those guns. Oh, right, I did, that's, yep. See, I'm already off to misinterpreting instructions. We'll go back and grab them. Um, <laughs> it's kind of fun, actually. It's kind of, it's just fun to see some animation. Yeah, no, I think that this is, uh, this is the type of thing where you could keep the switching really easy for your guests, or you could give them a really crazy brain puzzle. Um, because you have run around, so there's no <laughs> limit to how much you can push through them. It's just maybe you have to do a couple of saw moves to get all the cars through. So you could you could go as wild and crazy with that as you prefer. So on the train sim, how did the turnouts switch? It just you hit the you hit the you yeah. Hover over uh, it? Yeah, we'll we'll look at one uh, in just a second um, because that is a good question. So the turnouts when I'm laying the track, the turnouts are automatically correct. Uh, created by way of placing uh, a track down and then placing a track joint. So actually, I can briefly hop into track building mode. So if we place a track down, then we place another track and it intersects with it, boom, now we have a switch. Simple as that. So now let's look at the switch, uh, a switch that we already have in the game. So with that switch that's been created, you can see it's also done the liberty of creating the frogs and all the switch hardware. Uh, and then all that we're doing is just we click on the, the in, in this case, it's a, a junction lever. I'll swap these out for something more prototypical uh, when I do the fine building. But actually, I know what I'll swap them out for just to, to be fun and kind of cute. Um, we'll put some Caboose Industries ground throws for all of them because why not? And then we can change them to something different later. Um, and we'll do that partially because the Caboose Industries ones uh, are actually one of my first attempts at 3D modeling. So these are my 3D models of Caboose Industries ground throws. So that's what we'll use for today. Um, but yeah, so when we click on the, the switch, you can see that the, the switch rails actually align correctly. That's all there is to it. It's just point and click. There's also a keyboard command if you want to automatically toggle the switch ahead or behind it for your train. Uh, looking at the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, the Jason confirms that the horn that was on the 250 was awful. I thought we were going to get shot when we had to blow it. <laughs> um, the music. Uh, so, and also, I, I see. Uh, oh, uh, you're, you guys are talking about the Fort Wayne, uh, not Fort Wayne, the uh, Fort Dodge, Des Moines, in Southern. Again, I'm on an inner urban kick, so I'm really tempted to make that as a as a virtual build, especially if somebody had a track plan out there. That would be a fun one. Well, uh, Jason would be all over that, Nick. You should do it. Then we could definitely do that. Okay, so let's see if we're going to fit everything or not. Oh, did I switch all the... No, I didn't. I thought I did a bulk replace on those ground throws. So I'm going to just quickly do that. One of the other things I really like about uh, Train Z is that you could switch from your play mode to your build mode with just a simple keyboard command, which is really nice to be able to... Um, let's see if that, no, it didn't replace all of them. I'm not going to worry about that now, but it's very easy to switch between your build mode and your play mode. So if you want to just quickly tweak something without 
going full bore back into construction, you could do that. All right. So uh, as I suspected, we are. You can you can just delete one of those guns. Uh, sure. If the train master has given me approval to delete a gun, <laughs> who am I to disagree? Do, do, do the five finger, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, right the point and click. <laughs> Yeah, the point and click. click, exactly. But this is, I mean, this is the benefit of being able to, to ask this, is, is that especially if you, let's say you're making a time saver or some layout that you might exhibit publicly, to be able to test programs out uh, and mm -hmm. see, okay, what kind of cars can fit without having to do the shopping or get your cars out of boxes, to just see, okay, I have a 50-foot car, how many 50-foot cars can I fit, how many... 73 foot center beams exactly, exactly. Um, so you could have these sort of pre-scripted programs because obviously something like this you could randomize it and and just spawn cars as you see fit but it's also really cool when you could just have a preset program of these cars are here and here's a uh, here's a sheet that has mathematically calculated the perfect way to switch it and let's see how close to the, the perfect switch you could get kind of thing a lot of ways to turn it into a game. Well, you know, we're going to fine tune the length of the runaround. So if you have to delete a few cars, it's no big deal. Also true. Yeah. And, and then at that point, then it might actually uh, fit it. And we have a multitude of ways of measuring it, whether by you fitting freight cars in or just yield tape measure. And we can go that way about it, too. Uh, Dakota plays three. How have you ever thought about building the Midwest Central? Uh, I've heard of the Midwest Central, but I'm not, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, not sure what you're referring to there. Okay. Uh, so from here now we're playing around with the hoppers, correct? Yeah. Now we want to go pick up the, the, the two hoppers furthest yep. from the engine are empties and the the one closest is still needs to stay so we need to uh, pull those three and then drop them on the run around and then pull that loaded one and place it back can do you're good you didn't foul the uh, crossing no and I had to go back a little bit further. So Train Z has these kind of set uh, safety zones for every switch. And by default, it makes them larger than they need to be. Um, if it gets to be, if it prevents me from doing what I want at some point, I, I'll just go in and, and quickly reset them to another size. But we'll leave them as they are for the time being. You so gotta love the You got to love the smoke on the engines. You know, that's one thing we don't have on our scale models. No, it is a nice touch. There are certain ways in which we're spoiled. I mean, we're spoiled by that. We're spoiled by the, the directional sunlight that we can... Well, the light can be a pro or a con. Sometimes it's great for scenes like this where it's like, oh, now it feels really real as we're standing here. Um, sometimes it's a con because things will cast shadows. Like, you'll have mountains casting shadows and you don't want that because you wouldn't have that on your model railroad. It, it all depends on... So getting a nice ground view. Oh, I still set myself for the side. Oh well, we'll, we'll change that. Now you just use quick keys to jump back and forth because you can you can get inside the cab too, right? Correct. I, I've just jumped in the cab, which is actually a handicap at the moment because now I can't see how far I am from my cars. But it, it is certainly nice from just a fun standpoint. I, I when I'm when I'm playing with with trains and, and the model railroads, I, I sometimes I really like doing the above ground thing. I mean, there is an advantage to being able to watch the train going like this and say, "This is the prototypical view." Prototypical for a model railroad. Mm -hmm. Um. But other times I'll like to get to ground level and take, make end scale look gigantic and full size. 
Okay. Shove a little bit further in. Just to make sure we're clear. Oh, we're clear. Yeah, you're gonna have to put the you're gonna have to put those on the runaround track. Yep. Right, because otherwise we won't get the fire color, so Oh, and I want also not going that way. You're already fired, Nick. It's it's bad. It's it's <laughs> It, it usually is, Scott. There's usually some. I mean, I haven't been, I haven't derailed and been told to pee in a cup yet, but uh, that'll come when we come to a side and I'm like, oh, I think I have a couple more inches. And then you see these X's appear over the cars indicating that they've derailed. And I go, okay, maybe I didn't have quite as much room as I thought. Uh, Matt, being able to test signing length like this is awesome. Saves a good deal of potential heartache. Later on, if you're already laid down track and find that you need another three inches, great for testing that. Also great for testing clearances. Now, granted in the sim, um, things will just roll through each other. So if you're, and you have two tracks like this close to one another and we have this center beam hanging over. The center beam could collide with our locomotive and it wouldn't the sim wouldn't tell us that it there was a collision but you could still look and see if there's a collision so if you're especially if you're using a program like any rail any rail i've found is really converting an any rail plan into um into train z it is perfect with the rail alignment so if you have an any rail track plan where you see each of the individual rails when you import it into the sim and so your track lane is one-to-one -one as far as where your tracks are going to be. Then you can test, uh, put passenger cars and see if your overhang is going to result in it colliding with the track adjacent. Then you know to adjust it in the plan. Okay, yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. We'll definitely have to put them. I feel like we're going to have to roll around with these on the, the wrong end of the train for a while just so that we can have some stuff on the right end of the train. What we got up next? Yeah, and once you get those, once you get around your train, then we're gonna pull it down to the um, Mylon run around. Okay. I mean, I guess I could could take these two hoppers down to this second run around and just use that, right? Or you could just you could just push them all the way down if you want. Uh, okay, if Trainmaster says it's good, then that's what I'm doing. <laughs> well, I'm amazed, Nick. We're already two and a half hours in, and it feels like 15 minutes. Good. I I'm glad that this is fun and entertaining. That's the goal. Um, and that's honestly the challenge of when I'm built doing these switching uh, layouts is that I only leave an hour for it, and then I find myself going, oh, but I'm not quite there, or I get, get myself tangled into knots. Uh, as far as getting the work that I thought I would get done completed. I do have a fast forward button. Uh, that is the one secret uh, weapon I have. So I'll demonstrate that here where, oh, it's taking too, run around to, too long to run around the train. Oop, press the fast forward button. And there we go. It, it, it's, it basically just speeds up time. But the advantage of it is that you're not actually speeding up your train. You're just speeding up the time within the sim. It's a fast clock that applies to everything, essentially. Actually, in the sim, you can set a fast clock. So you could, you can set it so that the day progresses at a different time scale, uh, where your train is moving at real one-to-one -one time, but the sun is moving at a different rate of speed. So that's kind of a fun thing. Now that that is really handy because especially when you're trying to work out car movement, you just do it real fast. You know, you don't have to do it at prototypical speeds. Yeah. So if you're trying to play test something and you're not play testing it with the, oh I want to really be in it, but you're just trying to kind of zizz through a program, 
it's a great way of being able to to make your your moves happen like right now we're gonna we're gonna do this the proper way we're gonna really take in our work and, and enjoy it but uh, but this would be a really easy point to just fast forward until we get over to the uh, into downtown Milan now we can appreciate the crossing over the river which this is a great uh, perspective because actually there's what highway 67 that parallels these bridges so if you were looking at them in real life this is the way you'd be viewing them <laughs> And then where are we? Uh, where are we going to put these two hoppers? Oh, on the runaround. Yeah. Yep. Which means I'm set for the wrong line. So rewind. Okay. What? No, I was set to the right track the whole time. And here we go. Okay, so we'll stick them on the runaround over there. Interesting. I changed all but one of the switches. So. Are you going to be using Caboose Industries ground throws, or do you have something else in mind? I No, I just have model ground throws, and I actually use G-Scale uh, painted brass G-Scale switch stands on the fascia to actually throw the points. Oh, okay. So then I'll switch these out later with more prototypical looking ones. The Caboose Industries ones were just fun to do. I actually, I, I ended up building the Virginian layout, the model railroader project layout. And mm -hmm. that one's all uh, Caboose Industries ground throws, so that's why I ended up modeling those. Okay, uh, so we've got those hoppers on the run around. Uh, now, presumably, we have to get run around other things too, like these coil cars, eh? Yeah, you can just uh, get the train in the in the siding and then uh, you could probably just leave those uh, let's see hmm. yeah I don't know if we'll fit the whole I mean we could take the hoppers with us we could leave them on the the end that they are and take them with us for the run around right right but you still got more space a bit um... might have to delete uh, one or two of those coil cars once we get the once we get all the track lengths correct, it'll be more obvious what what yeah. fits and what doesn't. Yeah, and like you've got a looks like an ethanol tank there um, on the on the model railroad. There are just short little oh uh, the shorty tanks. Uh, the white the white tank. Yeah, uh, I think I have. Uh, let's see if I have one. I could just drive. You could just them. you could uh, uncouple and just leave those two hoppers underneath the bridge. Oh, uh, yeah. Here we are. Like these guys. Uh, well, you'll have to wait for a moment. But I found the tankers you're referring to. So, yeah, drop it in there. It'd be kind of fun. There we go. That's the that's the beauty of this time, Nick. It's just it's just having fun working things out. Yep. There we go. Sounds good. Too. Okay. All right. Now we can definitely fit the entirety of our train in. And the key thing too is also we talked about this last month. Um, with the East Craw Top Railroad that we were building. It's not always about having at the full size of train. Uh, sometimes it's just about the amount of moves that your switching requires. So having the coil cars, it doesn't matter if there's one or three, they still have to be in the right sequence and go to the same place. The only advantage to having more cars is if you're adding difficulty from a standpoint of how much you can fit around your runarounds and so forth. Uh, let's see, okay, now we're clear. Yeah, like they would have blocked those cars at the yard and so everything would have been real efficient, but it's still fun. Yep. 
Yeah, that that could be part of the the challenge that one creates is do you do it? Do you make it easy? Like everything's been set at the yard and all you're having to do is just go down the line or is the blocking a mess and then you have to tangle it out or untangle it. Going to do another ground view. <laughs> So we're spawning the coil car here, then we'll have to take the box car to the other spur, bring the tank cars back, and now there's a, does the center beam car need to switch places with the box car based on where they need to be set up in that staging? Wait, say that again. Okay, so at the moment, the box car goes into the staging first, then the center beam. But do we need to reverse that? Because there was something in your notes about how this, the lumber is accessed by a switchback. Yes. Um, but I think for the sake of this, we can just... Do them as just, they are. We can just put that center beam just next to the depot there and, and call it good. Okay. And, and, and Jeff Henderson was just saying, my Lynn, not my lawn. My Lynn. Okay. I've been through three yep. pronunciations of it today. But I think I think Jeff said earlier he he lives there or he knows the correct Yeah, name. he did, so yes, yeah, Mylin. Mylin? Okay. Well is it my Lynn or my Lynn? Like we have where now we have to figure out where the emphasis falls. My Lynn. The what? You're throwing out some big words there. <laughs> It happens. Uh, J Train, was there a setting you had to switch to make it do the ground level? Uh, no, that's just the camera. So there are different camera modes in Train Z. Uh, we've got, oh, actually, this is a good moment to jump into the cab and then we could appreciate going through the bridge. Uh, but you have a, a, a pacing camera, you have a. No, wait, you want. I don't mean to interrupt. Sorry, Nick. You want to uncouple those anchors there? Oops. Oh, I was spot. Uh, I was spotting the box car. The the center beam. You're going to spot on. That. Well, it, but isn't the box car going down the eagle branch as well? Yeah, but I think just for the sake of time, we'll. Oh. Oh, that's a cool view. Oh yeah, going the through the bridge. Yep. Going through the bridge. Yeah. Yeah, so, actually, this is dawning on me too late. Well, I, I don't know if I want to, I was just thinking I could share the screen with you and then you'd see it, but then it might mess up the stream, so I, I won't do that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we'll we'll throw the boxcar on here. Yep, that's good, that's good enough. Yeah. It's fun just seeing all the different uh, perspectives. Well, thanks, Jeff, for the proper pronunciation. I've been saying Mylon for like many years. Just goes to show. We're all learning something new on, on Great <laughs> Train Layouts Live. We're learning everything from train layout design to Iowa pronunciations. So all the natives around Mylon say Mylon. Nobody Mylon. says Mylon. Okay. Mylon. Which makes but sense. it goes to show how you, you see a name and it could be so many things. I, now I, I have to wonder what they'd make of me if I was showing up there going, oh, I, it's nice to be in Milan. Yeah. But that's the way to make it sound fancy. If I'm going on vacation uh, and I was just driving through there, uh, and then people ask, oh, where you been? I, and I could say, well, I went to Milan. Yes, Milan, Milan, and they'll say... <laughs> with, with the hand gesture, you can't see the hand gesture because I'm doing it through webcam, <laughs> but I'm doing a hand gesture to say I went to Milan. Um, yes. And they'll have, they'll have a very different idea of what happened and what actually happened. Um, Milan, okay. M with the accent on the my, Milan, okay. Uh, Milan. A slight accents on the, the my. Uh, he, he just says he lives in Coal Valley. Yep. Which is, is and see, crazy. Jason never corrected me, so 
strike against my friend Jason. <laughs> Maybe that was a long standing practical uh, joke so that we'd get to this point of being on camera and then we would be told, oh, wait, it's yes. violent. Yes. Now we do. You've been, you've been modeling it for years and you're pronouncing it wrong, you doofus. <laughs> yes. Uh, but honestly, I've. I found that with so many things that I, I come across because I'm building models of layouts from all around the country. And it's like, I, I come across it and I go, wait, is it this pronunciation or that pronunciation? What, what are we going with here? Uh, 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 Jason said, I tried to, Scott. He, he claims he tried to. Oh, you did? Well, sorry, Jason. Well, I, I, I blame advancing age. That's my excuse. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, so set off this uh, tank cars in the center beam. Now, at this point, setting. Uh, so we're going to set off the center beam on the other, and then we grab the uh, the aggregate cars. Hoppers? You can no, no, no. We're gonna leave those. You oh, can okay. just, you can just uh, uncouple that, um, that, that uh, steel coil car there. I did. It's oh, right. You're you're behind. Yes. Yep. The yep, steel coil. Two. I dropped the the coil on the tankers on the staging. So now we're taking, bringing the center beam back to the eagle branch. Perfect. And then you can just probably drop it on the runner, one of the runaround tracks nick and call her good i'd like to get your thoughts okay um also on some of the assets that people can purchase but some of them are really maybe we could zip over to one of those sites and have a peek at some of the quality because yeah uh you can do a, a quick look um i i could show uh, Honestly, what I'll probably do is I'll just bring up some of the ones that I, some of the payment models that I do have, and we'll bring them up oh, in the great, same great, and I'll, great. I'll show them that way. Because, um, yeah, I, <laughs> once you get uh, in, hooked into the, uh, the train simming side, then there's all sorts of different, uh, plenty of different toys to, to go down. But it's cheaper than buying brass engines. I'll say that by a long shot, especially when it comes to the steam engines. Lot cheaper. Did you read what frame rate said there? That's funny. Uh, frame rate. The only way I know how to pronounce the name of those mountains is. Ah, I'm a flat team dog. We're actually trying to manage it <laughs> on 30 different ways. Well, and I think the jury is still out on whether it is Appalachian or Appalachian. That that is a controversy. I will not find myself waiting into anytime soon. Okay, yep, and we're set to go back to staging, so we're good on that front. And uh, John Overman, uh, best way to remember it is it's like I'm going to throw an apple at you. Okay. Uh, that's, that's neat. Uh, J-Train, when will the switch stands be available to download? These Caboose Industries ground throws, they, they are available for download now. Um... You, they are on the download station. Just search Caboose Industries, and they should crop up. I have them in plain as well as labeled uh, with like green and red markers. <laughs> Some of these comments are pretty good. Oh, Pacific yeah. Productions, thank you for the, for the super chat. Have you heard of the Steam Deck? It's basically a stronger Nintendo Switch, but for Steam games, and yes, Train Z is playable on it. I have heard of it. I didn't realize Train Z would be playable on it, but that makes sense. Um, would I play Train Z on it? Probably not. Uh, I like using my computer. If, if I want the kind of game experience, I've got this controller that I use, uh, an Xbox controller that I have set up to work with the sim. Um, but thanks for the support. Uh, and uh, if you end up using it, uh, do let us know how you like it. Uh, let's see. So, 
And there we have it. So now we're... Oh, and I'll, I'll just show you this. Uh, you'll see it come up in your stream in, in just a few seconds, Scott. But I do have... Here's an example of the type of ground throw that I'll, I'll be placing along the route off stream. Uh, I have one of them in place. I was experimenting earlier. You know, it's interesting because the the train going back to the Rock Island staging is pretty much the, the right amount of time it actually takes the the engine to get back from where it is on the other side of the layout. So that's cool. Um, Good. Jason was asking, is there a GE 70 tonner that you've run across? Unfortunately, no, uh, I haven't, um, which it, it's something now that I'm dabbling in 3D modeling and I'm dabbling in getting and doing conversions for Microsoft Training Simulator because there is a recently made model uh, for Microsoft Train Simulator slash open rails of a 70 tonner, but I've never seen one for Train Z. Strangely, it's it's a weird gap because it is such a popular locomotive. I I don't understand why one doesn't exist yet. So, uh, how about a forty-four tonner? Forty-four tonner out there? Yeah, forty-four tonner. Uh, let's see. I don't know if I have what there. There's a company called Trains Forge with a Z that makes them. Um. I I don't have their payware ones installed. Uh, I have a, a freeware one that it's okay, but it's pretty dated. Um, but there is a payware company called Trains Forge that's with a Z. So trainz forge.com They have a number of roads available uh, for, is there, for that model. Is there a way, Nick, to render something in CAD and then import it into Trains? Yeah. Uh, I, I, yes. Because presuming that you could, I don't know what different formats you could export from CAD, but if you could export it to a mode that Blender recognizes, then Blender could convert it into what's called FBX, and then it would be able to be ported into trains. Okay, because um, J Jason's question about... Um... The seventy tonner. I know a, I know a, another modeler who does exquisite engines, and he might be interested in rendering it. And then, but he, you know, does it in CAD, and then he could just import it, and somebody could skin it, and you'd be off and running. Yeah, yeah, and that might be the type of thing that I'd even be willing to comp contemplate being involved in, um, because that it's it's a weird gap of something we we don't have yet. Um, so. Uh, what did you think of your first playthrough in digital form of your layout, Scott? Um, say that again. I was just reading some of the comments. Uh, yes, I and, apologize. And I have a super, another super chat from Pacific Productions I'll read quickly. I have actually used it to play trains at its great. The surveyor is surprisingly good to control with buttons and joysticks and the touchscreen, too. Well, I'm glad that it's working out well. Uh, you might convince me to, to consider it. Um, might I, I don't know I, I could go down so many rabbit holes with this thing but thank you again for the support really appreciate it um john overman what pc do i use to play trains it's a custom build uh golly this it um an uh, intel i7 well it's been several years since I've, i built it back in 2017 so i honestly it's an eight core processor uh i7 and the graphics card is a an nvidia gtx 1080 um those would be the main things to pay attention to um if you were building your own computer j train i have exported open rails locos to trains yeah I've, I've started doing a bit more of that i'll i'll show you actually um so this is kind of my first model that i'm working on uh with the caveat that it is not quite done but i'll show it off to you guys since we're going to be exploring talking about models a little bit um, this is a Brill motor car. It's a three model 350 uh, from the Fonda Johnstown and Gloversville Railroad. This is an MSTS model by Paul Charland. I imported it into the sim, but I've done a lot of uh, work on it since then. I replaced the couplers. I, I modified the shape a little bit. I added all the rivets to the side. 
Um, but the reason I'm going to show it off in particular, it has custom sounds. So the sounds that I'm using on this engine were recorded from East Broadtop M1, which is itself a Brill motor car. So it has prototypical engine noise. So the horn and the bell are both off of M1. We'll get it up to a little bit of speed so we can hear it. Up. So that's this is a model that I'm working on. And I'm pretty close to done. I need to add some detail to the end. I just tested to make sure nothing's broken or looking funky. But there you have it. That, so that's the kind of stuff that I'm starting to get into a little bit more. Uh, I still like the root building more, so I don't want to lose myself too much to 3D modeling. But it is so tempting to do. Oh, I look at this drawing and oh, wouldn't that look nice as a as a 3D model. I have a feeling I'm going to crash into something. Yep, I'm going to crash into that center beam. Oh no, I'm not because I'm going to pause the game and delete it. So yeah, uh, I love me my doodle bugs. So that one's going to be a freeware model uh, eventually once I've finished testing it. Okay, uh, Let's look at some payware, Scott, since you, you asked about that. Um, well, let's choose, let's go to a different route um, to choose something where it might fit thematically. We're going to go back to the Commonwealth Railway, which is a, a layout that we built uh, last year. I, I find it to be a good test bed of a lot of things. Commonwealth, there we go. And view sessions, create sessions. So you mentioned Tom Daneman earlier, Scott. Do you know Tom? Yes. No. Well, I met him once, but I don't know him personally. So this next layout, this layout that we're playing in now, this is the Commonwealth Railway. Uh, it's available for download now on GreatTrainLayoutsLive.com. And it's based on a Montana rail link track plan that he uh, he devised. And he never actually ended up building it uh, because he ended up moving before constructing it. It's an N-scale 12 foot by 6 foot layout. But I like it because uh, even though it's MRL themed and then I gave it a theming based on a fictional railroad called the Commonwealth Railway, there's a lot of things that just look good on it. So let's have a look at some of the things that look good on it. So I mentioned Trains Forge earlier. Um, if you like steam and you like uh, transition era, uh, then Trains Forge has you covered uh, really well. Their models are very nicely done. So this uh, it being an example of them, uh, there's a number of things that are fictional railroads that they have, but their fictional railroads are very well detailed. Like they have these fiction, the, the histories for these rosters. So this is a, I want to say this is a Lima uh, 482 Mountain for the fictional Minnesota Northern. Um, and this is, I, I've only recently uh, downloaded it, so I haven't played around with it a ton. So it probably has more features than what I think to even show off with it. But if we right click and view details, you should, uh, you could see. So the train class number you could change to, between uh, whether it's a scheduled train, whether it uh, has a following section, whether it's an extra, and you see the flags appear and the class lights change. Details like that are really nice. Um, you could change the train number. Smoke box door, you could actually open and look inside the smoke box. Uh, 
open and close the engineer's windows. It has a full cab view as well. So Train Z, I prefer driving trains with ECC mode, which is just your standard knob control setup. But there is a cab mode where you can control uh, the individual. Actually, I'm gonna let me take off the this, and then you can see. Okay, so here you can see the DCC controls, or the the DCC controls here, the big knob. But if we switch the control mode, now you have cab mode where your reverser and your throttle are all independently controlled. The physics in this game are okay. I wouldn't say they're great by any stretch, but if you want to have the feel of running a locomotive, eh, you could do worse. But I tend to like the simplicity of DCC. So actually, this is a sneak preview to next month, because next month we're going to be building an HO scale layout. I want to say it's HO, it might be it. But we're going to be building a shelf layout for the fictional Minnesota and Northern Railroad. It's based on an Ian Rice track plan that I've been wanting to do for a while, because it feels very practical. It feels very much like a, this could be whatever Midwest Railroad you want it to be kind of track plan. So this is a little bit of a sneak peek because this is one of the trains we're going to be playing with next week. So that gives you a little bit. We'll uh, we'll make sure our switches are aligned and then we'll let that run around in circles because we could actually stage meetings with it and so forth. Um, we'll set it at 25 miles per hour so that nothing crazy happens with it. Uh, another payware vendor that I'm really fond of uh, is Jointed Rail. Jointed Rail tends to focus pretty much exclusively on diesels and a lot of second and third generation diesels. Um, what, what do I have up there? That's pretty cool. I have a lot of things up there that are pretty cool. Um, sure, let's show off the Alco S2. Uh, so, this is their, Al I, I, I'm a sucker for Alcos, and especially the S2, it's a nice switch engine. So this is an Alco S2 that's undergone rebuilding, and also has the glass lights you'll notice at the bottom. And on this bottle you've got great sounds, horn bell, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, something neat about this one, actually, I should bring up. So this is the S2. This is the fictional S2B, which is basically a, a calf unit. So if you wanted to have a cow calf set up, this is your calf. Um, what's really cool about this calf is that it is... Uh, it's got these strobes on it. And I... Yep. You could also open up the the hood doors. So let's say it runs really hot. Well, you could open up the doors to cool off the engine inside. So a lot of neat features that these locomotives have. And then let's take a look. Uh, I'm going to put something else out on the main line, so we'll have it go this way. Let's have a look at K&L trains. K&L trains, uh, uh, what do I want to show off of theirs? Steve Laro does, uh, some amazing work, exclusively steam locomotives, few exceptions like motor cars, but most of his stuff is steam-based. Um, what... I mean, oh, I know what I'll show off of his, because it's a um, it's pretty recent creation of his. So one of his recent packs is the Reading and Northern 425. And so let us get that steam locomotive into the game, and we'll give it a short consist. 
Uh, we'll do the... We'll do the more recognizable version. The Thomas the Tank Engine Blue version. So we'll do that with a short consist. Sample consist. Short consist of eight faded coaches. Okay. There we go. And we're about to go into the tunnel. But we'll bring it out in a moment. So here, another great model. Um... So this pack that this locomotive comes in, it comes in five different liveries, uh, four of which it wore over its career, and one of which is a fictional one. Uh, full detailing, really nice detailing, uh, right down to things like you've got the animated bell. Really nice whistle on that. And a prototypical, prototypical cab. Yes, the back head is blue in real life. So, and then it includes a bunch of different passenger cars from the Reading and Northern Fleet. So that basically, if you've seen it on YouTube, you can recreate it in the train simulator. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to pull up to this signal and wait for that uh, Minnesota Northern train that we queued up earlier to just pass us by. Which it will do very shortly. And let's see how close we are to the edge. Oh, it doesn't show the train. So we'll stop there, because I think we're pretty close-ish. Where is my train? Oh, there's my train. But it takes a while to stop, because it has very realistic uh, momentum on. Oh, this is one of my favorite views. That's a screenshot moment right there. This design is one that I keep coming back to, because... I think that this is, I'd love to see somebody build this in end scale for real someday because it just really, it's a fun little layout. You get a lot of operation in a little space. You get a multiple trains on the main line. You get a little bit of local switching. You have little scenes like this that are pretty cool. So yeah, this would be a fun track plan to build in real life. At a 12 feet by 6 feet, that's not a space hog. And you can put it up against a wall, so... Number of advantages. So is there anything, uh, uh, those are the big three payware vendors I could think of. If there's something I'm leaving out, uh, let me know. I, I probably have something up there so that I can showcase. If I don't, then I'll say so, but. Gives you a sense of all of the model options that are out there. And a lot of these are really affordable. I mean, this steam engine pack, I think is $15 with the, for the 425. It's not that expensive. How about the Alco and that slug? Uh, that is part of a root package called Diamond River Mining. And, oh, I need to make sure I rooted my, oh, I have a feeling that, nope, he's on the other track. We're good. Um, that is part of a pack called Diamond River Mining. It also includes an SW 1500 and some other interesting goodies in the mix. Uh, I think that one's about $20. Some hopper cars, a shoving platform, a caboose, and a little... There's also a little module layout. Um, it's kind of like a model railroad. It's, it's probably bigger than you'd actually build a model railroad because it's about 100 feet long in HO scale, but it's a neat uh, operational coal mine. Uh, and then this engine... Maybe... Five or ten dollars for this one, for getting off the top of my head. So there's a lot of good options out there, um, and it's it's really fun because I mean this is why I love trade to is that it's so nice to 
you get you know you go down one path of oh, okay i'm really in the mood of playing with with this era of rolling stock and then it's like no i, I want to play with with something completely different and all you have to do is delete something and then bring it up so uh now i feel like playing with uh the commonwealth railway so this is actually another jointed rail uh, model here on the front end um yeah we'll we'll play with this one so this is another jointed rail model sent to me uh my my friend adi created this did a great job so here we have a youth uh b36-7 and the functionality on this again you've got cab lights you've got walkway lights class lights up front uh, and in the back you can open the windows That's a neat thing. yeah so this is a fictional railroad oh you can adjust the visor yeah I mean, the paint scheme is a big reason of why I built this layout for Train Z, because it looks legit. It's a fictional railroad, but it looks like this could absolutely be a real railroad. And so it felt like it needed, because they, they, they have a number of these locomotives in this paint scheme, but they didn't have any sort of route to go with it. So I thought, well, let's build a train layout so that these, pla these engines have a uh prototypical place to run there i like that the, there's a completion side of me that likes pairing rolling stock with layouts honestly some of the layout projects that i choose are things where i see a really cool locomotive out there and i go okay now i want a nice layout to play uh with that on uh looking at some of your comments uh john overman really loved the scenery and how much depth it creates well thanks yeah this i mean kudos to the plan because one of the fades that I think is so genius about this is anytime you're doing a track plan in which you have the train running through the same scene twice, the key is to not make it feel like you're going through the same space. And so the, by having the track never running side by side, but always kind of trying to stay away from itself, this viaduct scene feels like it's completely different location than this passing side. Even over here, this little spur to the cement plant doesn't feel like the same place as this uh, entrance to staging. And then the peninsula as well. It just This is what I'd call the magazine cover location. If you were taking a, a magazine cover of uh, for, for Model Railroad or Railroad Model Craftsman, this is your shot right here um let's see uh jerry train 30 bucks for the drm okay thanks for correcting me on that uh green coast trains used to sell some good stuff yes they used to and uh no longer are in business so sadly and i don't have anything in there, sadly. um but yeah there there's some really nice digital toys out there um and that's for, for me the only thing that that I could reliably say as far as what are my consistent loves of modeling. Greenfield Village, which is the train layout behind me, you see the bench work of. The Henry Ford Museum. That's my current layout. Uh, and then I'm a huge fan of Canadian Pacific. So I'm collecting a lot of CP steam and train, uh, diesel or early diesels along those lines. But so many things, I, I get swept up in, oh, I love inner urbans. Oh, I love... Uh, uh, the, uh, I love the fictional railroads like this uh, w with big mainline trains. Oh, I love switching industrial terminals. And so it's, you know, I only have so much space. I can't build physical layouts for all these things. So I find that building the digital layouts is a great way of scratching the itch of being able to try different ideas, see what things are sort of fads, which is okay because then I build the route and I, I move on. Or what's something where I keep going back to it and I say, I, I like this. I, I want 
something that this has. This is one of them. I keep going back to Commonwealth because I, I don't know if it's the era I'd want to do. Um, it's an end scale plan and scaling it to HO would present some challenges as far as reaching things, but gosh, it, it would be a nice one. So yeah, that, it, hopefully that gives you a good overview, Scott, of, of some of the the kinds of things that are available on the, the payware side of things for Train Z. No, that's great. I appreciate it, Nick. Thanks. My pleasure. And, you know, as far as I, I'm always open to your, your collective feedback. So if there's things you want to see me do, uh, different types of layouts or different types of railroading that you want me to, to show or talk about on the on a future live stream, please leave your comments. Let me know because I... I like being able to share topics that you guys think are interesting, uh, especially where we can we can model and we can learn while we're we're doing this. I think that there's there's a lot we can learn about model railroad. There's a lot we can learn about real railroad uh, as well. So uh, on that uh, triumphant note of, of being able to revisit an old classic, uh, Scott, thank you so much for uh, joining us here on Great Train Layouts Live, and thank you for commissioning me to build your digital layout i hope that it gives you a lot of fun and gives you a, a helps you to, to get a sense of what you're building towards and certainly helps out on the operational front yeah i appreciate it thanks so much nick and thank you guys for tuning in again try to keep these to every thursday uh, every fourth thursday of the month at 7 p.m but if you go to great train layouts live you'll see all our previous videos there and i usually write in what the next episode's going to be. Other than that, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel where you get notifications, not just about live streams like this one, but also the Roundhouse podcast. Episodes of that release every third Tuesday of the month. We have a lot of great conversations there too. Thank you guys for tuning in tonight. It's been a pleasure to have you along. Uh, again, reminder of the Patreon, patreon.com slash the Roundhouse to support what we're doing here on the live streams and to get early access to Roots. Again, uh, Lolita and Mad River, which was our live stream a couple months ago, that's going to be going up within the next couple of days for exclusive access. Uh, eventually, the Iowa Interstate uh, Milan. I got it. Milan branch is going to be up there too uh, in probably a month or two. Uh, and you head on over to greattrainlayouts.com and you can download the Valley City Street and Interurban, which, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing good time-wise. So I'm going to take one second and pop over to the Valley City Street and Interurban and show you guys uh, what that's looking like nowadays because we live streamed that. I think that was August of last year. Um, and I, I've, I've done a fair bit of work to it since, so... Let us bring it up in the sim, and you can see what we've got. Okay, so speaking of uh, Midwest interurbans, Valley City Street and interurban, this is a model railroad or track plan. I've seen published in a number of places, including one under two great track plans. This is a real world interurban of 1.2 miles that was a bridge between the Sioux Line and the Northern Pacific. It operated passenger. It did most, it, it, it only had one motor car. Well, it had this combine for most of its history. And then there was one other freight motor that came in to replace the combine. That's it. So if you like doing funky things, then switching freight cars with an interurban inter combine is, uh, might be up your alley. So a five by seven track plan, I think I grew it to eight by nine or 10 for the sake of making the outer run continuous. So that this is now available for download on greattrainlayouts.com. And I encourage you to check it out and, and have fun with it because this was uh, a neat little project to do. And it, it's a tricky one. It's small. Uh, there's the, Your trains aren't long, but the switching on it, can be deceptively tricky. So I encourage you to check it out, greattrainlayouts.com. With that, thank you for tuning in tonight, and I hope to see you on the next Great Train Layouts Live. Take care, everyone. <laughs>